Welcome back to the world according to Briggs and a supercut video. That's right, we're doing another supercut video. Back in December for the holidays, we did a compilation type video with I think six or seven of our videos that equaled about two hours that were nothing but positive, you know, kind of good feeling videos to warm you up for the holidays. Well, the holidays are over and it's back to what pays the bills here at World According to Briggs, negative videos. That's the sad state of our world, that negative videos get about three times more views than positive videos. But if you think about it, that's why cable news is still a business. They show you nothing but the negative stuff, so you keep watching. I don't make the rules, I just follow them. But today we have a few different videos going all the way back to the early days of when the channel actually started being a real channel, around 2018. And we end with a really cool video about Wyoming. That's really not a negative one. Just kind of tells you why people don't live there. That's one of my favorite videos I ever did. Let's take a look at the first one, Connecticut. Hey, what is going on, everyone? How about we go a third round with New England and take a look at the Constitution State, Connecticut. Connecticut has some other lesser known nicknames, the Nutmeg State, the Provision State, and the Land of Steady Habits. Now, the last one I know sounds like I made it up, but I assure you, it's a real nickname. It's a real nickname that origins go all the way back to the 1800s. The Land of Steady Habits was associated with Connecticut's tradition of assuring political stability through repeatedly electing the same officials to high office, even if they suck at it. To me, that sounds more like something you'd say about maybe a drug-infested neighborhood. You know, the land of steady habits. These people got a habit and they can't break it. Anyway, Connecticut has a long maritime history and a reputation based on that history, yet the state has no direct ocean front, technically speaking. The coast off Connecticut sits along the Long Island Sound, which is an estuary. Here it is right here. See, it's not really connected to the, well, I'm, it doesn't have ocean front. It, it is connected, but it's not really. You get what I'm saying. Connecticut is one of our smaller states, being 48th in size and 29th in population. The Nutmeg State is our fifth state being admitted into the Union January 9th, 1788. Connecticut is one of those states that more people are leaving than coming in. Out of 100 people moving, 43 move in while 57 move out. A little bit of a deficit there. If you ever dreamed about living in the land of steady habits, you might want to watch my top 10 reasons not to move to Connecticut. Number 10, really strange laws. Now, I always bring this one up because I think it's important to give you an idea of how they are. When you have strange laws on the books, it really does give you insight to the thinking of the community, the state, whatever. So I always bring this one up, and some people, why would that be a reason not to move? Just go with it. They have a couple really strange ones. The first one is, during the evil clown epidemic of 2016, yeah, that's what they call it, the evil clown epidemic, where all those idiots were going around scaring people dressed like a clown. I thought it was hysterical, but apparently became a problem in Connecticut. Connecticut had it so bad that law enforcement felt a need to outlaw dressing as a clown with the intent to cause alarm. Children's birthday parties were an exception. Clowns are just weird. Why do people do that in the first place? I don't get it. Anyway, they also enjoy a good dumb dog. Connecticut is one of the highest educated states in the country. However, they have actually a law in the books that people are not allowed to educate their dogs. For some reason, years back, a Hartford official felt the need to make it illegal to educate your dog. I think that's good because... I have a bulldog pug combination. I don't think there's any educating that thing. She's ridiculous. I just think it'd be throwing good money away trying to educate my dog. So I kind of see the point in this one. Number nine, lack of Connecticut culture. Now, this one I got from a high school friend who's lived in Connecticut, New Haven to be exact, since she got out of college in 1990. It's one of those ones you wouldn't pick up on unless you lived there. Connecticut lacks things uniquely Connecticut. Want to go to a bar? You're going to have to go to Applebee's. You want coffee? It's Starbucks or Dunkin' Donuts, and that's it. Connecticut only seems to have the big box stores and generic big companies. Notice I said seems. Stop typing. I'm sure you can give me a couple examples of some mom and pop places around where you live, but they are few and far between. Starting a local business 
is extremely expensive and not worth the headache in Connecticut. Then you factor in the declining population and it makes even less sense to start one now. Now, she did give me a couple examples around the colleges that they do have neighborhood bars or whatever, but there are very few compared to other states and other major cities. She also said if you're ever in New Haven, you need to eat at Frank's it's a Pizza Place. She called it Frank's. Frank's Pepe or something like that. On uh, Worcester and I think she said Chestnut. She said it's the best pizza place in the world. So we'll go with that. Number eight, moving out. Connecticut is ranked fourth in states with the highest percentage of outbound moves at 57%. Kind of touched on that in the opening of this video. Residents are leaving and it's no surprise to anyone. The older generation doesn't want to deal with the cold and the taxes on their retirement and the younger generation can't find jobs. Which brings us to our next on this list. Number seven, unemployment. Connecticut is ranked ninth in the worst unemployment rate in the country list. The current unemployment as of June 2018 is 4.5%. In Hartford, it's 7.8%, where the national average is about 3.7%. This is where I have to tell you that this stat changes monthly, so stop typing. It might be different two months down the line, and no, I won't update the video. You will just have to live with this one and let it go. Side note, when you DM me, or email me or put in the comments and say things like, I demand you correct this. My only question is this, what planet are you from where someone would actually do what you're asking when you say things like that? That's a real thing, by the way. It's happened more than once. Number six, taxes. Connecticut residents pay the third highest taxes. Their current income tax is 12.3%, and that's pretty high as it is, and it doesn't stop there. The state keeps increasing their taxes to fight their never-ending debt. In 2011, they raised their sales tax, cigarette tax, their corporate income surcharge, and instituted a luxury goods tax. I've got a better idea. Why don't you get someone to go over your books and find out where all your money's going, instead of just keep asking for more or forcing people to pay more? Some of your residents might stay in the state that way. That's just me. I'm not a tax professional. And please, don't forget to leave some smart comment right now about what I just said about not being a tax professional. I'm sure some tax professional out there is just losing it. He's going to give me the what for right about now. Number five. Connecticut is boring. There's nothing to do in Connecticut. Connecticut is historically boring. Matter of fact, the only thing to do in this state is historical stuff, tours and whatnot. After that, there's very few other options. Connecticut lacks nice, vibrant cities, people don't socialize, and it's expensive. And considering a vast majority of the populace is broke, even if there was something to do, they probably can't even afford it. Number four, it's haunted. Being one of the first settlements in the country, it's no surprise the place is haunted. Various places around the state are said to be haunted. There are many ghost tours, ghost towns, and they even made a movie called The Haunting in Connecticut. It scared the crap out of me. And if you really want to see something scary, take a look at The Haunting in Connecticut 2 and take a look how bad it is. That movie sucked. I paid to see that in the theaters. I think somebody owes me some money. That's like the only exciting thing to do in Connecticut is get scared. Well, other than dream about leaving... That's pretty exciting. Number three, not a place for retirees. The Constitution State does little to promote the general welfare of its retirees. It's cold, not a bunch of golf carts, and they don't have enough young people to listen to them talk about how good it used to be. They don't give them tax breaks. Matter of fact, Connecticut ranks among the most unfriendly tax states for retirees. Real estate taxes are second highest in the country. Some residents face taxes on their Social Security benefits, and most of their retirement income is fully taxed. No exemptions, no tax credits, nothing like that. It's almost like this state is being run by someone that wants to chase everyone out to have the state for himself. Number two, lack of sunlight. If you ever find yourself depressed and you're in Connecticut, it may be from lack of sunlight. Study after study found that lack of sunshine and vitamin D affects your mood. The state has only about 82 sunny days per year. In the summer, the average citizen sees about four hours of actual sunshine. And in the winter, the average citizen sees about two hours of sunshine. With all that lack of sun, you'd think they'd be big on vampire movies and legend. But they're not. I couldn't find really anything about vampires. I mean, they're big, that old Twilight Saga thing. No sunshine in Seattle either. People there are depressed as well. 
But really, the only thing sucking these people dry is their own government. And number one, Hartford. Yes, the whole city of Hartford, Connecticut is a reason not to move to Connecticut. I recently did a video on the worst major cities in the U.S. for 2018. Hartford was number nine. Now, considering it was up against things like Detroit and, you know, Chicago and Hartford made that list. And it's like they tried to make a list like that. The city's poor economic conditions are driving people out of Hartford. In the last five years, Hartford's population shrank by 1.3%. In the world of city stats and, you know, governmental stats for a good-sized city like Hartford, that's that's a big number. They also have a serious drug problem, and the problem isn't lack of drugs. They uh, Sounds like they have enough for everyone. And on top of all that, once you get outside, let's say, the downtown historic area, Hartford isn't much to look at. It's pretty much run down. It's too bad. Like I said earlier in this video, it honestly seems like someone is trying to chase the residents of Connecticut out of this state, and Hartford even more so. All right, so that's the top 10 reasons not to move to Connecticut. I hope you guys enjoyed it. Don't forget to hit all those buttons, like, dislike, tell me what you thought. Don't forget to hit that subscribe button. We're getting really close to the 100,000 this year. Everybody have a great day. Be nice to each other. All right, this second video is about why people are leaving Colorado. Colorado is a great state. It's been a go-to place for people looking for a new life since forever. I mean, about the time the gold rush slowed down in California, people started heading back towards Colorado. In recent years, it's kind of uh, the leaving has picked up steam while the moving to Colorado has kind of slowed down a little bit. Still popular, just not like it was before. Today, we're taking a look at why so many people are leaving Colorado. The Centennial State is one of those states that has always grown in population. Since the 1870s, when it was first included in the census, they have never lost population. As a matter of fact, Colorado only had one decade where it grew by single digits, and that was in 1940, when they only hit 8.4% growth. A couple of other decades, they grew triple digits, 387% in 1880 and 112% in 1890. So serious growth then. All that may be about to change. While data points to population growth slowing a bit in Colorado, the state's population is still expected to keep increasing because of a higher birth rate and a lower death rate. So why is the population growth slowing? Well, some research shows that more people are leaving than coming in, and that's the whole gist of it. Now, like I pointed out, this is new to Colorado. They've never had this before. Today, we're looking at the reasons why people say they're leaving according to a few surveys, including one I did. These are just the most common reasons people gave when asked why they were leaving Colorado or why they wouldn't move to Colorado. Got it, get it, good. Let's take a look. Number 10, the weather. Colorado's a combination of high elevation, middle latitude, and continental interior. This results as a cool, dry climate in most of the state. Sure, you get up into the Rockies, you're gonna have a whole bunch of snow, but most of the state is kind of dry. The entire state is not the Rocky Mountains. I know if you've never been there and you really don't study geography or anything like that, you might just assume that all of Colorado is mountains with trees and snow and everyone skis and sits in their cabin as a prepper. No, that's not the case. The eastern side of the state, like east of Denver, is pretty much flat and in my opinion, kind of desertish. They do have a lot of farmland out there though, but the weather does get kind of cold. This of course leads to a lot of retirees leaving because retirees don't like the cold too much. Even though I just did research for another video and I found out retirees these days are choosing colder places just to save a buck in retirement more than ever before. But if you're a retiree and you got the option, you usually leave the cold climates. Colorado is one of those places that can get pretty cold, even all the way out in Kit Carson, Colorado. I went through there one time and the streets are exceptionally large. <laughs> I don't know why. There's like no traffic whatsoever. But yeah, quite a few people say the weather is why they're leaving Colorado or they're not moving to Colorado. Number nine, the politics. Colorado's politics are complicated to say the least. It was once considered a swing state and Colorado's politics have shifted towards the left in recent years. Conservatives are leaving for states like Texas and Arizona. Now, I've said before, it's just me. Well, I'm sure most people, considering I just read a survey that said 65% of the US population doesn't pay attention to politics unless it's an election year. But they used to be kind of purple and now they're definitely leaning into the blue area. And some people don't dig 
dig this and they're picking up and moving to places like Texas and Arizona. Now, it is obviously a small fraction of people leaving because of politics, but it did show up quite often. This is another state. A lot of states are like this. It's kind of strange. You got Colorado, you got Washington, you got Oregon, you got California. One side of the state is red and the other side is blue. But more and more, Colorado is kind of blurring those lines. Some people don't dig it. They're moving out. You know, in a way, I understand it a little bit. You kind of want to be around people that share the same views as you do. And if you start seeing the people around you not sharing those views, you might leave. Myself, I'd kind of stay around and hope it changes. But other people just pack it in and leave. Number eight, high cost of living. Now, this is one of the first ones we got where it showed up quite often. The cost of living in Colorado is raising at a pretty good clip. I mean, all states are. Since the pandemic and the recovery from the pandemic, we've seen the cost of living go up in every single state. Maybe not Mississippi. So 49 of the states. Well, Colorado's cost of living has been going up faster than everyone else for about six years. There's argument that it could have been longer than that, but it was definitely about six years ago they started outpacing all the other Western states. Consistent. This is wearing on a lot of people and they're packing up and moving out again with the retirees, especially they don't want to live in a state where the cost of living is going up. They want to find a low cost of living to live out the golden years and not in golden Colorado. By the way, I may have mentioned this before, but when I was in the army, we convinced a guy that if you move to golden Colorado, Coors Brewery will drop off a case of beer to every resident every single month. They have a giant brewery there and to him, because he wasn't that bright, this made perfect sense. He actually suggested moving there to his wife because of the beer situation. As you can imagine, she thought to herself, I married an idiot. But yeah, a lot of people are leaving Colorado because of the cost of living. Number seven, wildfires and air quality. Colorado gets some pretty serious wildfires. Besides the fact wildfires are horrible, they destroy the air quality of the state, not just while the wildfire is going on. Sometimes it takes months for the air quality to get better after a wildfire. Now, on top of that, there's other issues with their air quality, not just the wildfires. Your typical industrial things, automobiles, all that stuff. But then you have to figure out their climate and a bunch of other things make the air quality in Colorado very unappealing. If you have any kind of breathing issues, this can take a toll on your health. Colorado is actually ranked the seventh worst state for air quality, which is strange because it's known for its outdoors. Outdoors usually means clean, pure and all that good stuff. No, they got bad air there. People with serious asthma should not be living in Colorado, at least most of Colorado. When you look at 2021's wildfire season and how many acres were burned, Colorado comes in eighth. Now, the absolute worst is California. It's, you know, three times the size of most states. They lost over 12 million acres. Colorado ranked number eight at 150,000 acres. You go a little further east in Illinois, and they lost less than 1,000 acres. In other words, their fire season lasts a good amount of time, which means you got some bad air quality. Number six, jobs. Now, Colorado isn't really hurting for jobs. They don't have horrible poverty numbers or anything like that. There's states that are much worse. It's just a lot of people from Colorado are being hired to other states that usually have a lower cost of living and they could get paid the same that they would in Colorado. So that one's just kind of basic. A lot of people listed why they were leaving and it was for work, a new job, new career, career move, whatever. Don't take that wrong. Colorado has a decent economy and all that, but it's just people leave for different jobs. Number five, retirement. A lot of people are leaving Colorado for retirement. Now, there's a few things that go along with this. One, the wildfires, the air quality, all that makes people move in retirement. They don't want to stick around for the bad air quality. Of course, the cold weather, some retirees leave for that. Another thing is they want to find cheaper housing, lower cost of living. A bunch of things on this list kind of go into the retirement thing, but a lot of people list that they're leaving because of retirement. I mean, think about it. When you retire, you want to lay down on a beach someplace. Not much of that going on in Colorado. Number four, the homeless. Now, Colorado overall really doesn't have that big of a homeless issue. I think as far as states go, they're ranked, depending on which stat you look at and which study, they're either 15th or 18th. So it's not terrible. Denver is where they have the most. And again, they're not terribly bad. In the country, they're ranked 13th or 14th, depending on what study you look at. But the people that are leaving Colorado have a serious problem with the homeless population that they have. Now, I always got to say this, I have nothing wrong with the 
homeless people. I think they're people that are in an incredibly bad situation. Most of the time, as we all know, it has to do with mental illness or drug problems. But with a large homeless population, you get a bunch of problems and you have to address those problems and it just becomes a drain on any city. And it is tragic, but people don't want to be around it all the time. A lot of people pick up and move. And that's what's happening to some of the people that leave Colorado. And I'm sure most of the people that answered this on the survey probably came from Denver. I doubt if you drive all the way out to the unincorporated community of Last Chance, Colorado, you're going to find many homeless. A population of 23 people. I mean... With numbers like that, if George gets in Dutch with his wife and has to spend the night in his car, you've got a homeless epidemic in your city. Or unincorporated community. Side note, in 2012, a wildfire burnt most of that town. But yeah, people list that homeless is a reason they're leaving or not moving to Colorado. Number three, the crime rate. Okay, so Colorado's crime isn't that bad. If you look at their property crime, that's kind of big. It's their rank like eighth in the nation. But their violent crime rate, they're ranked 21st in the nation. Now, those are 2021 numbers. Complete 2022 numbers are not available yet. Things can change, but not that much. Of course, you're going to find a majority of the crime in their biggest cities like Denver. More people means more problems. That's where most of your crime comes from. People living on top of each other. If you look at population density, density graphs and crime rate graphs, they sort of mimic each other. So the crime rate in Colorado isn't as bad as I think a lot of people think it is. They have some crime, but you compare it to some of the other states and the other major cities, it doesn't stack up. Is Colorado the safest state in the nation? Absolutely not. Is it near the worst? No, but whatever's going on there, enough people put it down as it's something that's driving them out of the state. If you're one of those people and you want to get out of Colorado because of the crime, I think your best bet is move to upper New England with Maine, New Hampshire, and Vermont. Sure, it gets a little cold there in the winter, but those are the safest states we have. Number two, housing costs. This has been a problem for Colorado for a while, especially longtime locals can't stand it. Housing prices there have you know, usually climb faster than most other states in the area. Now, you got to take California out of the equation. They don't count because their home prices are just ridiculous. But back in 2020, January of 2020, the median listing price in Colorado was $404,000. That peaked in June of 2022 at 583000 Side note to that, it's down a little bit, just like about every real estate market in the nation. Right now, it's down to 571000 Over the last few decades, Colorado's housing has hovered between 15 and 20% above the national average. And that is chasing a lot of people out of the state. All right, before we get to number one, if you're looking to move to another state, there's a link down below for Home and Money. It's a great website that has all kinds of things to help you find a new home, including getting in touch with a real estate agent, whatever part of the country you're going to move to. All right, on to number one. And number one, the F word, family. That's right, people are leaving Colorado because they wanna live closer to family. Now, this isn't anything wrong with Colorado, obviously. It's just the number one reason given why people leave the state. There's a million and one reasons why people would wanna live near their family. Honestly, I would have loved to stay near my family when I first moved up to Oregon, but when Facebook and all that came around, we were mostly keeping in touch that way, even though we were all living in the same city and state. Some people don't use Facebook and would really just just like to be near their family, and that's why they move. Most of the time, it's the older folks that are moving closer to family. As you get older, you want to be around family, things like that, and especially if you have like grandkids, all the things that happen in their life, you want to be as close as you can to be able to go to, you know, things like soccer games and graduations. That becomes very important, especially as you get older. So all those of you listening to this that are under 30, you're probably thinking, I can't wait to get away from my family. That's how a lot of us feel in our 20s and stuff, but as you get older, you realize in most cases, you want to be close to your family. Now, sure, if you had a bad home life growing up, you're probably like, what are you talking about? I hate my family. But really, most of us want to get closer to our family. And that causes people to leave states, even if they like the state, even though they might think there's nothing wrong with the state, they got to be closer to their family. That's the number one reason people leave Colorado. All right, the next one is Arizona. I can think of all kinds of reasons not to live in Arizona. Number one, the heat. I'm not a desert guy. Let's take a look. What is going on everyone? Welcome back to the world according to Briggs and a video about the Grand Canyon State, Arizona. 
Arizona was the fifth most moved to state in 2019 and 2020, and it looks like it'll be the fourth most moved to state in 2021. The state capital of Phoenix is one of the most moved to metro areas in the United States right now. Arizona is the sixth largest state and the 14th most populous state in the U.S. with about 7.3 million residents. It became a state on February 14th, 1912, like a Valentine present for the United States. Arizona is also known as the Copper State. They pulled a lot of that mineral out of the ground throughout the state's history. We did this video a little over three years ago, and it's time to take a look again because a lot has changed in Arizona. This video just has 10 things that you should know before you move there. These are negatives to most people, but may not be a big deal to you. We're all different. Arizona, like all states, has its pros and cons. This video is just the cons. Let's take a look. Number 10. Monsoons and haboos. You ever heard of a haboo? Basically, it's a big dust storm. Haboo is actually an Arabic word for blown. When a haboo hits, cold air in a front of a storm rushes down at an incredible rate, picking up a massive amount of dust, clay, sand, whatever, and starts blowing them in the direction the storm was heading, blocking out sun almost completely and making it impossible to see. This is something that if it's a really bad one, you just want to pull off the road and wait for it to pass. You'll find these in other areas throughout the West, but this is where they can really get bad, especially the Phoenix area. Do they happen all the time? No, but can they get bad? Yes. Then you have monsoons. Monsoon season runs from June 15th to about September 30th. Most people just assume like, you know, Pacific Islands and Japan and stuff like that get typhoons and monsoons. No, Arizona gets pretty serious monsoons. Monsoon is basically an intense thunderstorm that often results in flash floods. That's the most dangerous part about a monsoon in the desert, the flash floods. Number nine, the heat. This one's a no-brainer. It's Arizona. You know it's going to be hot throughout most of the state. They do have some mountainous areas that get kind of cool, but a majority of the state is really hot, especially the southern section, like Phoenix on down. May to September are the hottest months for Arizona, and it's usually in between the 90s and like 120 degrees Fahrenheit. Hot. The good news is, it's, for the most part, a very dry heat, so you don't get that Georgia, Alabama, Mississippi sweltering heat with humidity. And if you happen to move into one of the concrete buildings that Arizona has so many of, it gets even hotter during the summer. Just holds that heat in. On the bright side, you can wear a hat, tank top, shorts, and flip-flops a good portion of the year. Number eight, the air quality sucks. The national average for states with poor air quality is about 104 days a year. Arizona has around 220 days of unhealthy air quality every single year. Now, air quality, when it's bad, it sucks, especially if you have things like asthma, whatever. But in Arizona, you also get this thing called valley fever, which is really called coccidioid meiosis. And I know I said that wrong. Here's how you spell it. But valley fever is a fungal infection that is caused when organisms in the soil get lifted into the air and you breathe them in. You get a fever, a cough, and tiredness. This could be put into the air, by construction, farming, strong winds, those hubaloos, whatever. Gets in the air, there's a chance you can get this. Mild cases will resolve themselves. Severe cases, a doctor will treat you with antifungal meds. I've never had this, but what I've read sounds like it really sucks. The air quality obviously is going to be worse in places like Phoenix, Tucson, whatever. Around the cities, air quality is always the worst, but the air quality throughout the state of Arizona isn't that great. Even in the more rural parts. Arizona is the fourth worst state for air quality. Number seven, you're going to need a car. If you like to walk to work or ride your bike to work, whatever the case may be, Arizona is not the state for you. I mean, besides they have a lot of land out there where a lot of people might want to move to. It's kind of rural, deserty. You know, you can't ride a bike around there, especially if you want to get any place. You're going to need a car. But when you get into the cities, you run into all kinds of other problems past the heat. I mean, it's extremely hot here, like we've already discussed. Riding a bike, really blows. On top of that, the neighborhoods are really spread out because it's desert. They got a lot of land, so they spread out all the neighborhoods and all the small towns and suburbs. Of course, when you get into the cities, you got to deal with traffic and stuff like that. Phoenix was actually voted one of the least walking friendly cities in the country. The American Public Transportation Association has Phoenix listed as the 55th worst out of the top 100 states for public transit. But on a positive note, Arizona has some of the lowest car insurance in the nation. You can say, a bunch of money and spend it on a skin graft when you sit on leather seats during the summer in shorts. Number six, underfunded schools. 
I've talked about this one before when talking about Arizona. They don't spend money on the kids. Arizona school system ranks towards the bottom of the nation. The U.S. Census Bureau ranks Arizona 49th in the nation in terms of per pupil spending for fiscal year 2019 and 2020. But we know 2020's numbers, I'm sure, a little skewed because of the pandemic. But compared to all the other states, they still spent less. And in 2018, they were ranked 48. Arizona spends a little under $10,000 a year per student which is well below the national average of $15,700. I saw different organizations have different numbers, like one teacher's association said they spend less than $6,000, but I'm going by the census. Number five, the crime rate. Arizona is reportedly the 10th most violent state in the nation. In 2019, they were number 11. 2020, they were 10th. And it looks like 2021, they're shaping up to be the eighth most violent state in the union. In 2019, the national average for violent crimes was 366.7 for every 100,000 residents. In Arizona, it was 455.3 for every 100,000 residents. Phoenix is obviously going to be the most dangerous city they have because it is the most crowded city they have. That's just how crime stats work. More people, more population density means more crime, not as much policy or policing. It's just when you have a whole bunch of people living together, there's more opportunity to do some really crappy things to each other. There's also a lot of Karens there. They're not really violent. They're just nauseating. Every time I watch one of these Karen video things, you know, women out complaining or men in some cases, which are called Kens, they always seem to be in Arizona. I don't know what that's all about. I saw one where the lady wanted to call the Phoenix Police Department because they forgot the cheese on her hamburger, like, Burger King or something like that. And this woman was throwing a frickin' fit. Number four, poor healthcare options. Arizona's healthcare system is ranked third worst in the nation. Yeah, they suck. These rankings measured percentage of residents without healthcare, state healthcare and hospital spending per capita, adults that are considered to be in poor health, the number of hospital beds and employee premium contributions. All these things get thrown into the number blender and they come up with this ranking. 11.3% of the residents are uninsured, giving them the ninth highest uninsured rate in the nation, 18.6% of the residents are considered to be in poor health. That's the 14th highest in the nation. There are 65 doctors for every 100,000 residents. That's the eighth lowest in the nation. The national average is 76 for every 100,000 residents. Number three, not the best internet coverage. This one is becoming more and more important to people. A lot of people are moving to Arizona to save on real estate and cost of living, all that, and maybe work from home. You're going to need a good internet connection if you're doing this. Obviously, the cities like Phoenix, Tucson, wherever, are going to have decent internet, but there are a lot of small towns with really bad internet or no internet at all. And if you try and tell me that, no, everyone can get satellite internet, have you ever tried satellite internet? I had AOL dial-up in 1995, and it was faster than a a lot of these satellite internet companies. Arizona is ranked 30th when it comes to internet coverage. The national average for internet speed is 40 Mbps. Arizona, it's 33.9. If you're just checking emails, things like that, surfing the web and not like gaming or doing some serious work from home, that's probably fine. I'm an internet snob and that would drive me crazy. I need my internet so much faster. Number two, water. The water quality in Arizona sucks, and as you can imagine, being a big desert state, access to water can be a little dicey. Roughly 40% of Arizona's water is sourced from groundwater. I mean, it's a desert state, but they still have droughts where, I don't know, they're even more of a desert state. 84% of Arizona is experienced severe drought conditions. And that's like all the time, it seems like. Most Western states, other than, you know, the Pacific Northwest, are dealing with that. California, New Mexico, Nevada. They're desert that's what happens. Arizona, and especially California, have been dealing with a really bad situation for a lot of years. As Arizona continues to grow and they build more homes and more people flood into this state, it's just going to get worse. All right, before we get to number one, don't forget we have another channel called On This Day. There is a link down below. There's also a link for Amazon Audibles. It's audiobooks. I listen to it all the time when I travel. This isn't a sponsored video, but I do get a small kickback if you sign up, just so you know. It's the only thing I ever promote. All right, on to number one. And number one, the California Invasion. 
Arizona is one of the main destinations for Californians trying to get out of that state. This has been going on for about 10 years and it's causing some problems. Traffic's getting worse, Phoenix, Tucson, all the cities. Housing's going up all over the place, like I said, the water issue. And of course, it's raising prices on both cost of living and housing. I try not to get political on the channel, really, but one thing that a lot of people complain about in Arizona is a lot of Californians are moving there and changing the way they vote. Really though, a majority of of Californians that are moving there already vote, you know, along red lines like most of Arizona. So that's not as much of a worry as most Arizonans think. One of the biggest reasons Californians are leaving California is because of political things. They don't agree with what's going on in California, so they want to go someplace where people kind of see things the same way as they do. That's a majority of the people. But for many years, Arizona has been like a big welcome mat for people to get cheap real estate and a lower cost of living. And it's not as much a thing as it was 10 years ago, and it's just going to get worse. So if you're in your 30s and 40s and moving there because wherever you're coming from is just far too crowded, 10 years from now, it's going to be just like wherever you came from. So it's good now, but not for long. All right, now on to Delaware. Delaware, we don't talk about that much on this channel. I don't know why. It never really comes up. That's why I sort of threw this one in here, just so we could talk about Delaware. But these are the 10 reasons not to move to Delaware. Hey, what is going on everyone? Let's talk about the first state, Delaware. When I say the first state, I mean it was the first state, and subsequently the first state was taken as Delaware's nickname. It has a few other less known nicknames, the Blue Hen State, the Diamond State, and the Small Wonder. Oddly enough, the Small Wonder was a nickname a high school girlfriend gave me, and I, I don't know why. I mean, I'm five foot nine, and that's I know that's not considered really tall, but it's definitely not considered really short. Never understood that one. Oh well. Being the first state, as you can imagine, it has some history especially colonial and revolutionary war history. It is also home of many historical and famous people. Just recently I found out my favorite Parks and Rec cast member Aubrey Plaza is from Delaware. If you ever want to get a good laugh, YouTube some of her interviews on like Jimmy Kimmel or whoever, David Letterman, old ones and stuff like that. That girl's amazingly weird. In case you don't know where Delaware is, it's right here between New Jersey and Maryland. Delaware is ranked 49th in size, 45th in population. Like I said before, they are the first state and they were admitted into the Union on December 7th, 1787. Now, the thing I've always noticed about Delaware is you never hear of anyone moving to Delaware. You only hear of people that are from Delaware. Like, it's a good place to be from, but not go to. I looked it up, and you know, they still have people going in. They're ranked 15th in population growth, with 7.5% between the 2010 census and the end of 2017, which is, it's okay growth. It's definitely not the best, but it's definitely not the worst. So, people are moving to the first state. If you're thinking about it, you should probably watch my top 10 reasons not to move to Delaware. Number 10. It's haunted. Delaware is old, and when you have anything that's old, they say it's haunted. Everyone loves haunted things, so those stories keep going and going and going. Even though uh, one of my early videos I did was on haunted Portland places, and it never did well. I, I was disappointed. I found it very interesting. Too bad not a lot of other people did. Maybe it just sucked. I don't know. I'll leave a link below and let you decide. Anyway, there are dozens of places that claim to be haunted in Delaware, including the Dixon Mansion in Dover. Now it's a museum, and it's the childhood home of former congressman and delegate for the U.S. Constitutional Convention in 1787, John Dixon. Tons of people have reported seeing or hearing him throughout the house. Number 9. Miss Delaware. Now, obviously, this isn't a reason not to move here, and it's not a good representation of the average Delaware residents. I get that. Stop typing. But if you move to the first state and tell your family and friends, someone will bring up this tidbit of Delaware embarrassment. In 2013, Miss Teen Delaware, Melissa King, had to resign, giving up her crown to her runner-up, Haley Lawler. Because of an amateur porn she did, got leaked. Then, in 2014, Miss King was arrested for criminal trespassing. When the officers asked for her basic information, she told them they could just Google her. Classy. Number 8. Small and Boring. At only 96 miles long and 30 miles wide, Delaware is the second smallest state in the country, right behind Rhode Island. Living in a smaller state does have some positives, but it has just as many negatives. A smaller state means less options. WalletHub.com ranked Delaware's nightlife 50th. Number one was Nevada. Entertainment and recreation was ranked 48th, as was performing arts theaters per capita. They ranked 47th in restaurants per capita, and all around fun, they were 46th. Number one was California. In other words, if you want to have a good time, be prepared to drive across the state line. 
Number seven, taxes. Delaware has some really low taxes. They have no sales tax. Their property tax is about average. Their income tax system is made up of seven brackets, the lowest being 0% and the highest being 6.6%. Now, Wilmington does have a flat income tax rate of 1.25%, and that's some really low taxes for a state. Now, I know this all seems great, and some of you have already started typing. Just don't. You have to look at the downside of low taxes. Low taxes result in bad schools, bad roads, not enough cops, not enough emergency services, and they lack other government-funded projects and programs that all the other states have. Sometimes taxes need to be put in place. Maybe not crazy taxes like in California and stuff like that, but you need to get a little more money to run a state. Number six, strange laws. Now, I always like to add this one because they're normally funny, and they also kind of give you an idea of how the locals think. The first one is pawnbrokers can't accept wheelchairs, fake legs, or fake arms for payment or pawn. Now, okay, I, I get it. I don't have any missing limbs, and I get around without a wheelchair, so I've never thought about pawning those things. But I find it strange that they actually had to put it into a law. Now, the second one is in a town. Every October 31st, kids enjoy trick-or-treating all night long as a Halloween tradition. It's just what they do. But not the kids living in Rehoboth Beach. For one reason or another, they can only enjoy this tradition from 6 p.m. to 8 p.m. on Halloween. And if Halloween falls on a Sunday, they must trick-or-treat the night before on the 30th during the same time. Rehoboth Beach has a couple other strange ones. One, you cannot pretend to sleep on a bench in Rehoboth Beach. And the other one is they have strict rules when it comes to outfit changing. It is illegal for you to change your clothes in a vehicle or a public restroom, so come prepared. Or just don't go to Rehoboth Beach. Number five, Toddler Fight Club. As if Miss Teen Delaware wasn't weird enough for you, I present to you the daycare workers in Dover that were arrested due to a video surfacing of the kids in their care fighting with the adults encouraging them to fight. Because of this video, it is believed the daycare employees were running a toddler fight club. The employees involved were charged with assault, child endangerment, and conspiracy. And it got worse when they figured out the kids were, you know, performance enhancing. They were snorting Flintstone vitamins and, you know, they're getting all juiced up and going out there and scrapping with other five-year-olds. Number four, no good jobs. Delaware isn't a good place for the just-out-of-college crowd. The first state is more for the retirees. It's estimated that about 61% of the residents born in the state will move out. This is mainly due to the job market. The best jobs in the U.S. right now are obviously tech jobs. Delaware has zero. They didn't do the whole tech thing. They didn't encourage tech companies to come in, nothing. Instead, Delaware's leading career path is the healthcare field, more specifically caregivers, as in the people who come to your house to make sure you didn't pass away during last night's final jeopardy. Yeah, those people. Oddly enough, Delaware leads the country in people arrested at bingo nights. I thought that was kind of strange. Just shows you they have far too many retirees there. Bingo fraud and whatnot. Number three, opioid crisis. Delaware is going through a severe opioid crisis, like a lot of other states, but theirs is pretty bad, especially being as small as they are. The state ended 2017 with almost 190 opioid-related deaths. Now, it's gotten better here in 2018, but they're still right in the mix of a serious crisis. I guess when there's nothing to do in a state, you just do drugs, right? Doesn't sound like a good plan, but maybe that has something to do with it. I don't know. It's a sad situation. Number two. Schools. Delaware has a notoriously bad school system, and I'm sure someone wants to cherry-pick some stat in an attempt to prove me wrong. Just stop typing. The school system is in such bad shape because of the low taxes and the lack of a decent budget. The students' test scores are always low. Only about 45% of the 3rd grade to 8th grade students score passing grades indicating they're not getting a quality education. I've said this before, and I'll say it here. This is politicians dropping the ball. When you get a class or maybe a school that has bad scores, sure, maybe it's a teacher or a group of teachers. They're all humans. They can be bad at their job just like any other human. If you have kids, don't take them to Delaware for an education. Matter of fact, if you have kids that are scholastically challenged, take them to Delaware. They might be the head of the class here. And number one, Wilmington, Delaware. What can you say about a state with a city that is affectionately referred to as Murder Town, USA? The first thing you can say is, don't move anywhere near Wilmington, Delaware. And if you already live there, you could say, move out of Wilmington, Delaware. The city is one of the most dangerous cities in America. And what's really strange is some of the residents take pride in this. That's nothing to be proud of. There's no better way to inform the world that you have a poorly functioning frontal lobe than bragging about how dangerous your town is. Idiots. I came across several videos of people doing this. They're always so proud about how dangerous Wilmington is. On average, the city experiences about 78 crimes per 1,000 residents. 
As of 2016, a couple years back, they didn't even have a homicide unit because of budget problems. My understanding is they have a small one now. This has got to be one of the most poorly run states, and the way Wilmington is run, it's just proof of that. The overall crime rate in Wilmington, Delaware is 136% higher than the national average. In conclusion, if you're a retiree and you decide to move to Delaware, make sure it's nowhere near Wilmington. If you do, you might pick up another title besides retiree, and that's victim. Don't move to Wilmington. Stay away from it. And before you do, stop typing. I'm sure there's at least one decent neighborhood somewhere in the vicinity of Wilmington. Every town has one. All right, so that's the top 10 reasons not to move to Delaware. I hope you guys enjoyed it. I hope you got some information out of it. Don't forget to hit all those links below. Subscribe if you haven't already. All that good stuff. My Patreon thing is always there for you to click on and support the channel. Everybody have a great day. Be nice to each other. All right, this next one's about bad neighborhoods. Let's take a look. What is going on, everyone? How about we talk about neighborhoods that sane people try and avoid? On this channel, we've gone over the worst things about states, cities, towns, zip codes, airports, my cousin's wife, and other horrible places. We also did a few videos about bad neighborhoods in different cities, and people really seemed to like them. So I thought today we would just look at the country's worst neighborhoods. The harsh reality is we have some places in this country that probably should be vacated, fenced off, and forgotten about. What I love about these videos are the two type of people that comment on bad neighborhoods. The first are the people that say it isn't that bad and I don't know what I'm talking about because I'm not from there. The only thing I can say to that is stop typing, numbers don't lie. The second is the person that attempts to look hard and gain some street cred and take some sort of pride in being from here. Here's the thing, living in a really bad neighborhood isn't a good thing. If it was, the people who become successful from that neighborhood would actually stay there. They don't, and they rarely come back. A crappy neighborhood isn't something to be proud of. Doing something about that crappy neighborhood to make it better is. Wake up. Now we can do a video series on this one, two or three at least, from all around the country. There's that many. Some of these neighborhoods are really close in the level that they suck. So this really won't be in a hardcore by the numbers order. I'm gonna do my best, see what we can do here. That being said, why don't you lock the front door, put a chair against it, set the alarm, and watch my top 10 worst neighborhoods in the United States. Number 10, Downtown Rockford, Illinois. Life in Downtown Rockford is pretty dangerous. Violent crimes have been on the rise so much that any person in the area of Downtown Rockford has a one in 13 chance of being involved in a crime every single day. This last October and November, it was a little busy in the Downtown Rockford area. They had three pedestrians hit by cars, two people arrested for firing guns in the air, four people shot out in front of different bars, one man shot in front of his apartment, one man shot while sitting in his car on the phone. They had a couple of stabbings and not too far from downtown in August, someone decided to fire shots at or around the Auburn High School football game. Good times in Rockford. <sighs> Number nine, West End, Cincinnati, Ohio. West End, Cincinnati is not where you want to be ever. The main streets of this area look nice and promising, however, once you get into the more residential parts, it's where you start to see garbage in the streets and, you know, boarded up windows, abandoned homes, dogs missing legs and eye patches, and broken down fences. All the things that are what you'd see in a really bad movie about a bad neighborhood. It's going on here in West End, Cincinnati. It's no surprise that while in this neighborhood, you have a 1 in 12 chance of being involved in a crime. Two nights ago, three men were shot and one died early Sunday morning. This was all on the West End, Cincinnati. Cincinnati police say the first one happened on Court and Central Avenue. According to the police, the victim took himself to the hospital but was gone before they arrived. Then on Finley Street, they found an SUV that was all shot up. Inside, they had a man who had sprung some holes recently and now was deceased. They also had tracks showing that someone else that was in the vehicle had sprung some holes also and but had left. What is the deal with people leaving the scene of these things when they've been shot up? If you shoot me, I'm sticking around for some help. Well, I mean, unless someone's still shooting, then maybe I'm gonna, you know, beat feet, but still. You know what I mean. Number 8, West Jeffries Freeway in Seabolt Street, Detroit, Michigan. This neighborhood is not a good one to get turned around in. 
lost, whatever. The crime rate here is 140% higher than the national average, with around 60 reported crimes daily in this neighborhood alone. It doesn't seem to be letting up anytime soon. The year-over-year -year increase in crime is about 13%. In other words, this place isn't much safer than a lot of war zones. You can get any one of these three gems for just under 30,000 each. Oh look, at least someone took the trash to the curb. Now if they could just find an armored trash truck, someone might pick it up. Number 7. Chelsea Avenue, North Claybrook Street, Memphis, Tennessee. This neighborhood is a smaller one near the New Chicago area of Memphis. And yes, this one is just like some of the neighborhoods in the original Chicago. This neighborhood boasts a fatherless household rate that is 90% higher than the national average. This usually indicates high poverty rates as well. And this one does have high poverty rates. Single parent struggle. Trust me on that one. If you don't know and you were lucky enough to be raised by two parents, single parents do struggle. If you were raised by a single mom, mom and aren't in jail or rehab, call your mom and say thank you. A lot of men are dicks in this world. This neighborhood is suffering in part because of that stat. Number 6. Whitman Park, Camden, New Jersey. Whitman Park is a neighborhood where you never want to send your children to school. The average student's test score is 76% lower than the national average. Only about 62% of the residents will graduate high school and only about 2% of them go on to college and get a four-year degree. That is some of the lowest numbers I've ever seen while I've been doing these lists for those two categories. High school grads and four-year college. That's just way too low. They have no jobs. Camden is always on the most dangerous list. It's in New Jersey, Whitman Park is a giant hole of despair. Nothing good is going on here. Oh, I'm sorry. Rent is dirt cheap, but then again, you got to worry about dying all the time. Make sure you have good health insurance. Number 5. Orange Street and Broad Street, Rochester, New York. Rochester has an overall crime rate that's 71% higher than the national average. This neighborhood specifically has had an overwhelming rise in murders, assaults, and robberies in recent years. Don't move here. It's just getting worse. People keep mentioning that Rochester is bad. I haven't been there since I was a kid, so I always remember it being nice. I guess it was back then, or I was too young to realize the suck that Rochester had to offer. Not sure. Number 4. Russell Woods, Detroit, Michigan. Russell Woods is a neighborhood just east of I-96. The crime rate here is 132% higher than the national average, with a total year-over-year -year increase of about 14%. While you're in this neighborhood, you have a 1 in 12 chance of being involved in a crime. And yes, this is a crime, or at least it should be. Nobody should be allowed to paint their home that color. That's horrible. What sucks about Russell Woods is that there are blocks here that are nice and well-maintained. Some really nice homes around here. Turn the corner, and it Looks like Godzilla strolled down the street while doing the bird box challenge. Number 3. McDaniel Street, St. Mary Street, Atlanta, Georgia. This area of Atlanta is scary. The rate of robbery and violent assaults have risen in the last few years, giving you a 1 in 10 chance of being involved in any crime. You have a 1 in 15 chance of being assaulted. That means if you go on a group interview at Home Depot, one of you is getting stomped in the parking lot afterwards. It's also hot as balls in the summer in Atlanta, and it's a known fact that the heat increases the crime rate. So no group interviews in July or August in Atlanta, okay? Number 2. James Buchanan Drive and 1st Street, Jackson, Tennessee. Hey, Tennessee made it twice in this list. That is strange because majority of this state overflows with good people and amazing landscapes. But this neighborhood seems to be void of both of those. It's not a place to settle down. The homes here are either apartments or one bedroom homes, oddly enough. Chances of people moving here and settling down and giving this place a better, you know, look, feel, curb appeal, whatever you want to call it, is not likely. I think the best thing that could happen to this neighborhood is a possession bulldozer with a full tank of gas. And number one, City Center East St. Louis. Right now, some of you are wondering, where's Chicago? Well, Chicago does have some bad neighborhoods, just not as bad as the media makes them sound. Crime and murder type stats go off averages or per capita. Chicago has far too many people to make it on a lot of these lists. They'll probably be on the next one. I'm sure they will. But back to East St. Louis. The city center area of East St. Louis has definitely seen some better days. You'd probably have to go back to the 1800s to find those days. Today, however, this is not a place you want to end up. Have you ever seen that movie Escape from New York? It's very similar. The crime rate here is 175% higher than the national average. There's about 22 reported violent crimes occurring daily in city center East St. Louis. While in the area you have a 1 in 12 chance of being involved in a violent crime. That's a great stat. Now everyone together here. Let's all say this together. Hey Siri, never let me go within 100 miles of city center East St. Louis. 
Here's what I found on the web for never let me go within 100 miles of city center East St. Louis. Have a look. That was great. And now we get to disasters, natural disasters. I'm not talking like movie disasters like Napoleon. Have you guys seen that? It's horrible, horrible. You know how sometimes really big things happen in nature that have the potential to really screw up your week? Well, these things are called natural disasters. They happen suddenly, and they can wreck things like buildings, land, even people's life. In the United States, we face various types of natural disasters. Some of the usual ones are floods, hurricanes, earthquakes, tornadoes, wildfires, blizzards, tsunamis, and Gary Busey interviews. Talk about buttered sausage, where it comes from, what it does. This is a subject I'm asked about all the time. If that's something you need to know about, about. I'm gonna give you this video, but there's also a website I go to for a lot of this information. It's replaced Zillow as my favorite website. It's called Where Might I Live? And they got this wish list function. You could put down what you require. You don't want a bunch of natural disasters. You want low crime, you want good schools. Put all that in and it spits out which counties in the United States are best suited for your criteria. They're not sponsoring this video. I just think it's a pretty cool website. There's a link in the description area below. Anyway, back to the natural disasters. When these disasters strike, they can mess up a lot of things. Houses can be destroyed and businesses can lose a bunch of money that might take them years to recover from. Now, it's just not the loss of money and housing and all that. Some people go through one too many natural disasters in an area and they decide it's time to move someplace else. I know more than a few people in Southern California that have moved because of the wildfires. Today, we're looking at the states that reported the most natural disasters in 2022. Now, I'm also including how many times the federal government declared a natural disaster in a state since they started reporting those in 1953. Got it, get it, good, let's take a look. Number 10, New Jersey. New Jersey's had a lot of disasters. Not all of them are natural. You have the MTV show Jersey Shore. That was a disaster. You had all kinds of super fun sites back in the day. And there's a place called Camden, New Jersey. But the natural disasters come from New Jersey's densely populated coast. It's vulnerable to flooding, storm surges, erosion, rising sea levels. And during certain months and certain years, the water gets a little warm and gets a little tropical and kind of sucks hurricanes up that direction. They've been hit with quite a few over their history. Storm Surge Sandy was the worst natural disaster in New Jersey's history. It caused $83.9 billion in damages and 43 fatalities back in October of 2012. Hurricane Ida, which was the remnants of Hurricane Ida when it finally hit New Jersey in 2021, it cost $80.2 billion in damage. And then of course, Hurricane Irene hit in 2011. That took about 17 billion in damages. They've also had Hurricane Ivan in 2004 that cost about 32 billion in damages. So they've had some damage done to them by mother nature. The statistics that were released in 2022 were actually 2021 numbers. And that year, New Jersey declared 47 natural disaster areas, which sometimes included calling out the National Guard, things of that nature. Now, when it gets serious, like Superstorm Sandy, Hurricane Ida, and all those other ones, that's when the federal government gets involved and helps out. Every state has a handful of state emergencies every single year. But New Jersey called out 47 in 2021, and the federal government has called out 50 since it started reporting these in 1953. Number nine, Kansas. Kansas has a lot of things going on there. Tornadoes being the biggest one, flooding also, then you get ice storms, lightning strikes that normally cause some form of fire, flash flooding, droughts, winter storms, all that good stuff. Kansas ranks second place for tornadoes from the years 1997 to 2022. They're ahead of Oklahoma and behind Texas. Yeah, Texas saw the most in that time. Now, back in the day, Kansas had some serious problems. They had an earthquake in 1867 in Manhattan, Kansas. 1875, they had a major locust swarm, which you don't hear that too often. And of course, in 1935, the Dust Bowl. Kansas is most famous for its tornadoes, thanks to The Wizard of Oz. Have you ever really thought about The Wizard of Oz? What happened in that movie? A tornado transports a young girl and her dog to a magical land where she kills the first person she meets and then teams up with three strangers to kill again. 
In the 2022 report, Kansas declared 55 natural disasters, and since 1953, the federal government has declared 70. Number eight, Florida. This one, yeah, it surprises me because with all the hurricanes they've seen over the years, you think this would be much worse. Sure, they're in the top 10, but I mean, just when you watch the news and the history of Florida, you think they have a potential to be in the top two. They're not. I mean, until Manatee decide they've had enough and start attacking people. Florida sees a lot of different natural disasters. Hurricanes, obviously. They've had a few winter storms. They have storm surges, wildfires. And believe it or not, they average about 60 tornadoes touched down annually in Florida. Most of them don't rise, almost all of them don't rise to the level of, you know, major damage or a natural disaster, but they do get them. And that's a fact. I've had to look it up a couple different times. I've had people complain, I've lived in Florida my entire life. I've never seen or heard of a tornado. If you're leaving that comment, I got some bad news for you. You get about 60 a year. But hurricanes are obviously what really does damage to Florida, which chases a lot of people away. I don't have time to list all of these hurricanes. Here's a couple of the biggest ones, and they're the bigger ones we've ever had in the nation. Hurricane Katrina. This hurricane was one of the most expensive natural disasters in United States history. Over $108 billion lost. That's not just in Florida, the entire thing. It is the third most deadly hurricane in U.S. history. You had Hurricane Andrew, which just destroyed things. And in 1926, they had the Miami hurricane. This hurricane had 150 mile an hour winds, and it killed 372 people. The state of Florida in 2021 declared 61 natural disasters, and the federal government since 1953 has declared 130 in Florida. Number seven, New York. I don't know, maybe it's because I've spent most of my life on the West Coast. I've never heard of many in New York. I know they get some serious winter weather, but they've been hit by some hurricanes or at least tropical storms that have been devastating. Now, New York shares a lot of the same problems that New Jersey does. I mean, other than Camden. They're right next to each other, so it only makes sense. But they get severe storms, floods, winter storms, wildfire, tropical storms, tornadoes, landslides, and droughts in New York. New York's coastal location makes it susceptible to hurricanes and tropical storms every single year. Now, they don't always make it all the way up to New York, but it seems like every year at least one starts getting a little close and making people nervous. And then on the sad occasions, they hit. Hurricane Hurricane Sandy, Hurricane Ida, Hurricane Ivan. In 2021, they had a winter storm and cold wave that cost $25.6 billion to the area. They've even had a couple earthquakes. In 1944, they had the Cornwell Messina earthquake. And in 02, they had the Osable Forks earthquake. But the big ones for New York State are going to be the winter weather. You had the 2004 Christmas Eve winter storm. They had in 07, the North American ice storm. 1971, the Great Lakes blizzard. These have all done some serious damage. In 2021, New York State named 63 natural disasters and the federal government since 1953 has declared 95 in New York State. Number six, Tennessee. Tennessee sees a lot of different types of natural disasters. And I'm not even talking about their weird fascination with mullets and lamb chop sideburns. The natural disasters that Tennessee is prone to include severe storms, floods, wildfires, tornadoes, tropical storms, landslides, power outages. They're not really a natural disaster, obviously, but usually natural disaster causes them and it creates bigger problems. They've even had a couple earthquakes. The most frequent natural disaster Tennessee sees is going to be the tornado. In 1952, they had the Oak Ridge tornado. In May of 2011, they had the major tornado break out there. Flooding is another big one that happens in Tennessee. They have so many lakes, rivers, streams, creeks, whatever. They've got a lot of water everywhere. It causes a lot of flooding. In 2021, Tennessee declared 64 natural disasters, and the federal government has declared 69 since 1953. Number five, Kentucky. In just the last two years, Kentucky has recorded several billion dollar events. These events include the December tornado outbreak in Western Kentucky, that was in 2021, the historic flooding in Eastern Kentucky in July of last year, 2022, and the March 3rd windstorm. That one impacted pretty much the entire state. But they see everything. Severe storms, floods, like I said, tornadoes, winter storms, wildfires, tropical storms get up here occasionally, along with landslides and earthquakes. 
Earthquakes aren't a really big thing for them, but the tornadoes and the flooding really do some damage to Kentucky. In 2021, Kentucky declared 147 natural disasters, and since 1953, the federal government has reported 74 in Kentucky. Number four, Oklahoma. This one is sort of a no-brainer. I mean, it's in Tornado Alley. Actually, where Oklahoma is located, it's known as the Eye of Tornado Alley. Most tornadoes in Oklahoma happen between April and June. The deadliest tornado in Oklahoma's history was in Oklahoma City in 1999, May 3rd to be exact. It was a F5 tornado. That tornado did $1 billion in damage and 36 people died in that tornado with another five that were in direct fatalities. Oklahoma declared 155 natural disasters in 2021. And since 1953, the federal government has declared 173 natural disasters in Oklahoma. Oklahoma. Number three, Mississippi. Where do you start with Mississippi? I mean, the entire state can be considered a natural disaster. The Magnolia State sees severe storms, hurricanes, extreme heat and drought, tornadoes, floods, winter storms, landslides, and they've had a few earthquakes. Nothing major, though. They were another state that was hit by Hurricane Katrina in 2005 and April of 2011, the tornado outbreak, which killed in total all the states, 321 people. In March of this year, President Biden declared major disasters after straight line winds and tornadoes struck Mississippi. In 2021, Mississippi declared... 202 natural disasters. And since 1953, they have had 75 major natural disasters that the feds got involved in. Number two, Louisiana. When you're talking about natural disasters in Louisiana, right away you're thinking hurricanes. They've been hit by so many hurricanes. In my lifetime alone, it's insane. Obviously, the biggest one was Hurricane Katrina in 2005. Katrina's storm surge caused levee failures in New Orleans, flooding 80% of the city. Louisiana didn't get a break. Hurricane Rita hit. This Category 3 hurricane made landfall in southwestern Louisiana less than a month after Hurricane Katrina. Way back in 92, they had Hurricane Andrew. Then, of course, Hurricane Harvey, which was a Category 4 hurricane. It made landfall in Texas and Louisiana in 2017, causing catastrophic flooding and over 100 deaths. Now, back before I was born, they had Hurricane Betsy in 1965. It struck New Orleans, causing levees to breach and flooding in more than 160,000 homes. If I was going to build a house in New Orleans, I would put it on stilts like they do in North Carolina's Outer Banks and other places. I think Texas does that too, some of their beach cities. In 2021, Louisiana declared 327 natural disasters. Since 1953, they've had 79 major natural disasters that the federal government got involved in. All right, before we get to number one, don't forget one of our other channels is called The Sweet Life for Briggs. There's a link down below. We're starting to upload some videos here really soon. We've got a couple on there right now, but we're getting ready to upload a few others. All right, on to number one. And number one, Texas. Yep, everything's big in Texas, and that extends to their natural disasters. They get some pretty good ones out there. I would have thought Louisiana would have beat them, but no, here's Texas. That's obviously because it's a bigger state. They got a lot more land to have a lot more natural disasters. They get flooding, wildfires, tornadoes, hailstorms, sinkholes, erosion, and drought. They say an average of 132 tornadoes touch down in Texas every single year. They average 900 wildfires every year. Not all of them get to epic proportion and require the National Guard or anything like that, but they got a lot of dry grassland that makes Texas particularly prone to wildfires. In its history, Texas has had the highest total costs associated with drought, severe storms, and winter storms. Now, they've been hit by some serious hurricanes. Uh, if everyone remembers a few years back, Hurricane Harvey just nailed the state. That one was so bad with the flooding and everything. People are, <laughs> it's like if you owned a canoe, you could win back an old girlfriend from a really bad relationship. When Hurricane Harvey hit, it, you know, I just noticed this. I watched a lot of news at the time and watching what was happening there. And it kind of, I don't know, reignited my passion for life in a way, just to see people helping each other. They didn't need to help them. These are normal citizens helping, you know, older women out of their homes that, you know, were maybe in a wheelchair or walker. You know, guy puts, well, I just remember this one guy, like waist deep in water. He's got this older woman who lived a couple doors down from him, giving her a piggyback ride over a mile away in water just to get her to safety. 
there's so many things like that. You know, I know it's a disaster, but it just kind of gives you hope for mankind when you see people doing things for other people that not benefiting them, really. There was a quote, I think it's from a book or a movie. I, I heard it online, but it said, society works best when older men are planting trees. They know they'll never have the pleasure of sitting in its shade. Natural disasters bring that out in human beings, and that's the best part about a natural disaster normally. Of course, then you have the other side of the coin when you have people real estate people, developers, trying to buy homes of people that are still looking for their loved ones in Hawaii after that fire. One lady said she was getting four or five calls a day, emails, anything else. They got her information. They're trying to get a hold of her. She's trying to find, like, her aunt or something that's missing. Anyway, let me get off my soapbox. Texas saw 510 natural disasters in 2021. Since 1953, the federal government has declared 255 major natural disasters in Texas. Sticking with disasters, let's take a look at Arkansas. Today I'm going to tell you why Arkansas has a growth chart that looks like a scary roller coaster. That's right, today we're looking at the state that has more jokes told about it than any other state. If you're a baby boomer or a Gen Xer, chances are you've heard a few jokes over the years that had to do with Arkansas and probably getting hitched to a close relative. Jeff Foxworthy made a career about making redneck jokes. He's from central Georgia, but every single joke he told could be said about Arkansas just as easily. Its nickname is the Natural State and it has a very strange growth chart. In the early 1800s, it saw triple digit growth, and then it dropped down to double digit for a few decades. Then they had a few decades where they were in the negative, then they went up to single, then to double digits for a couple decades. And in the last decade, they saw 3.3% growth thanks to a high birth rate and a relatively low death rate. Things are slowing down in Arkansas again, and it's predicted that they will lose around 5% of their population by 2030 just because people aren't moving to Arkansas anymore. So why is this? Today, I'm gonna to give you the results of a survey where they asked people that were getting ready to move had they considered Arkansas. And if they said no, they had a few things they could choose from as to the reason why. In these videos, some of the reasons are the same as other states, but the stats are always different. They also asked the people that lived in Arkansas if they would ever recommend moving to Arkansas to a family member. 62% of the people in Arkansas said no. Got it, get it, good. Let's take a look. Number 10, the weather is hot and humid in the summer. The average temperature in July is about 92 degrees Fahrenheit and the humidity can be oppressive. If you've ever spent a summer in the South, you know exactly what I'm talking about. And the whole area has that swamp smell to it too. Now, the winters can be cold and in some areas it can be very snowy. The average low temperature in January is about 32 degrees Fahrenheit and there can be a lot of snow that follows that. Now, I bring up the fact that they have snow because for some reason, people seem to think that the southern states don't get any snow. That's wrong. They do get snow. Do they get Minnesota, Wisconsin snow in January? No, but they do get cold and they do see some snow. Number nine, it's too rural. Yes, this is a big complaint for people. They think it's too rural. I mean, it kind of plays into their whole natural state. It is kind of rural. Their cities aren't terribly big. The most populous city in Arkansas is Little Rock, the state capital, and they only have about 204,000 residents. Now that's just the city itself, the whole metro area, has less than a million, 748,000. Arkansas is filled to the brim with little small rural towns. And when I say nice small rural towns, I hope you don't get the image of New England small town or anything like that. They do have some nice small towns, but a majority of them are the type of place where you get off the interstate, get a glimpse of the town, and the first thing out of your mouth is, keep driving, I can hold it. Arkansas only has a population of about three million residents. Most of them live in small towns or rural areas. Number eight, the poverty. Yep, a lot of people don't want to move here because this state has legendary poverty levels. Right now, they're doing better, if you want to call it better. Give an example. In 2020, at one point, their poverty level was 18.6%, meaning almost one in five people in Arkansas were living below the poverty line. Now, they've gotten better. In 2022, they got all the way down to about 15%. At that time, the national average was about 11%. Arkansas also has a really low median Median household income. In 2021, the median household income in Arkansas was $47,260. The national average at that time was right around $63,000. 
Number seven, the crime rate. The crime rate in Arkansas is nuts. Really, it's their violent crime rate is kind of crazy. Nobody really has much to steal, so there's not a lot of property crime. In 2022, the violent crime rate in Arkansas was 4.2 for every 1,000 residents, meaning four people basically are going to have some sort of violent encounter every single year out of 1,000. Now, property crime has done 100,000, but the property crime rate was 2,211 for every 100,000 residents. Two of their most notorious cities for crime are Little Rock and Pine Bluff. Let me give you the stats on that. In Little Rock, the crime rate is 217% above the national average. Their violent crime rate is 432% above the national average. Pine Bluff is worse, believe it or not. Can you get worse? Yes, you can. Pine Bluff, their total crime rate is 238% above the national average, while their violent crime rate is just a hair over Little Rock's 433% above the national average. Go Pine Bluff. And crime always keeps people away. Now, obviously, to be fair, a lot of their smaller towns aren't going to have crazy crime rates like Pine Bluff and Little Rock, but still, on average, there's a little bit higher than other states. Number six, education. Yeah, the education system ain't great in Arkansas. The state has a really low high school graduation rate in 2020. It was 82.7%. Now, that's not the worst. The absolute worst is Arizona with 74% graduation rate. Most of the country is in the low 90s. On top of that, only about 25.5% of Arkansas has bachelor's degree. And overall, their public education system is ranked 48th in the country. Number five, healthcare ranking. Arkansas doesn't have the best healthcare system. I, I mean, I'm sure it's fine, but most of the time in cases like this, it's accessibility. How many hospitals do they have? How many clinics do they have? How many doctors and nurses do they have? Usually that is where the problem is. Arkansas ranks 47th in the country for healthcare. That's not great, especially if you're, you know, of a certain age. If you get up into your 50s, you're Start looking at things like that. When you're 20, 30, I understand you don't care if they got doctors at all because you're invincible. Wait till you hit about 47. Number four, you're going to die sooner than later. Yeah, Arkansas, they have a really low life expectancy. In 2020, the life expectancy in Arkansas was 73.2 years, which was lower than the national life expectancy of 78.2. You're losing five years just by moving to Arkansas. All the New England states are 79 years, 79.1, 79.2. The highest in the country is Hawaii with 80.7. The leading causes of death in Arkansas Heart disease takes 22.3% of the people. Cancer takes 20.8%. And one guy died from having his cheeks super glued together. I guess he went into a panic and uh, had a heart attack of some sort. Number three, politics. Now, this one always shows up on these lists. People have a problem with the politics, whatever state it is. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with anyone's politics. It just, some people, it bugs them. I don't get it, but is what it is. So here's the rundown on politics in Arkansas. The state is politically conservative. Arkansas is a very conservative state, and its politics are often dominated by social and religious conservatism. This can be a turnoff for people on the more liberal or progressive side of the political spectrum. So much so that it was voted number three for why people won't move to Arkansas. Number two, travel. This is a weird one. So it's hard to travel to Arkansas. Arkansas is not a major transportation hub. Arkansas doesn't have any major international airports, and it's not a major stop on any major interstate highway. This can make it difficult and expensive to travel to and from Arkansas. If you don't travel a lot, there's parts of the country that are just too far away from any of the big cities. Get too comfortably, I guess you could say. Not comfortably, within reason. Like if you want to fly to, I go to Honesdale all the time. I have to leave Portland and land in some place like North Carolina and then come back to Scranton. And then I still got an hour's drive. If I landed in Philadelphia, I got a two hour drive up here in Portland, Oregon. If you wanted to go to Bend, you got to fly into Portland, Oregon and take like a three hour drive down to Bend. Well, the entire state of Arkansas is kind of like that. I mean, Little Rock has an airport. It's just not one of the major ones. So not a lot of flights come through there. If you're going to fly there, a lot of times it's like you got to fly to Atlanta. Then you got to come back to Arkansas. Arkansas. Or in some cases, you got to fly to Chicago, then to Atlanta, then back to Arkansas. Or you got to go to Salt Lake City, then to Dallas, then to 
to Arkansas. If you're someone that travels for work, this is a big turnoff, and I could see why it would make it on the list. I don't think it belongs at number two, but apparently this is such a problem in Arkansas that it makes it number two on a list like this. All right, before we get to number one, don't forget we have another channel called On This Day. There's a link for that channel down below in the description area. Please go over and subscribe. All right, on to number one. And number one, teen pregnancy. Yes, this is a problem, especially if you're a parent. Arkansas has a high rate of teen pregnancy. In 2020, the teen pregnancy rate in Arkansas was 14.5 for every 1,000 women aged 15 to 19, which was higher than the national average of 10.8 for every 1,000 women. This can definitely be a concern for parents who are considering moving to Arkansas with young girls or young boys. Someone's got to get them pregnant, right? I have a friend that actually moved her kids from Tennessee because she had three daughters. She has three daughters. And where they're from in Tennessee, that's kind of the trend. It's what happens. She's all, I don't want my girls around that because if your friends are kind of doing things like that, sometimes you slip into that mode too. We always hope our kids go to school and fit in, you know? Sometimes they fit into the wrong things too, not just the good things. All right, the next one is, all right, the next one is, <clears throat> All right, this next one is about California. There's a million and one reasons people aren't moving to California anymore. I think this is one of the first videos we did on that subject. I think we've done three so far. What is going on, everyone? Please answer in the comment section below. I love hearing how people are doing. Of course, unless your name's Lloyd and you're from Salt Lake City and you can't quit calling me a soy boy. I've never eaten soy. It seems kind of gross. I do know a bunch of UFC fighters swear by it. I'm not sure why you think this is an insult, but all right, moving on. Today, we're going to take a look at everyone's favorite punching bag, California. In case you've never made it through a U.S. geography class, California is right here. It's on the left side of the United States. California is known for Hollywood, beautiful beaches, suntan lotion, and the gold Golden Gate Bridge. Ever since some bearded frontiersmen found gold at Sutter's Mill, California has been the destination for people seeking their fortune. After gold kind of washed up, it was oil, then it was Hollywood, and then there was tech. There's always been a draw to California. The draw is still there for a lot of people. The only difference is a higher percentage don't see it anymore. They don't feel that draw and they're leaving for one reason or another. The exodus of California started around the early 1990s. The Golden State was losing between 400 and 600,000 residents and their kids every single year. While during that time, they were only gaining about 300 to 350,000. So, you know, depends on where it was, but they could have been losing anywhere from 50,000 to 250,000. It was bad. During the late 90s and the early 2000s, there was a giant difference in the loss versus gain. Some years saw as many as 200,000 people leaving than coming in. As we entered the new century, there wasn't much of a difference. It was pretty close to being even. But as we got closer to the recession, California had a serious spike in the percentage of people leaving versus coming in. Until the last couple of years, the exodus has started picking up steam again. So let's find out why they're all leaving. In my top 10 reasons, people are leaving California. Number 10, traffic. If you didn't see traffic being on this list, you haven't been paying attention. Los Angeles and San Francisco are in the top five for worst traffic every single year since forever. Sacramento, San Jose, and San Diego aren't too far off that list either. I grew up in the LA area and traffic has always been bad. I think I've mentioned it before on this channel, but I've been stuck on LA freeways in such bad traffic, my car didn't move for over 15 minutes, like at a complete standstill. I've actually had conversations on the 405 freeway with other people in the cars next to me, more than once. Number nine. It's not business friendly. Now, you can read different things on why California is one of the best places for business. Those things will always seem like they're promoting why a company should move to California or at least stay. They will tell you about their educated workforce and how all these other companies have started in the Golden State. But the fact is, major companies are leaving and small businesses claim the state of California is actually hostile towards small businesses. Here's some of the corporations that have left or are planning to leave California. 
Now, before I get to this list, you should know most of them are heading to Texas. Toyota, Toyota North America is gone. Nissan North America is gone. Nestle USA is gone. Jamba Juice is gone. Even Chevron, who's been in California forever, has moved 800 jobs from the Bay Area to Texas. There's a bunch of other ones that are moving to Pennsylvania. Even Carl's Jr., which started in California and has been there for decades, up and left. Number eight, natural disasters. Earthquakes, wildfires, mudslides, and Kardashians. California has some of the worst disasters in the country. Now, I've worked a forest fire, and it was scary. I've been in too many earthquakes to remember, and I've binge-watched a season or two of the Kardashians. So I've seen some pretty scary stuff. Every year, wildfires and mudslides wreak havoc on the state of California. You also have coastal erosion. Whole portions of California coastline are literally falling into the ocean right now. I know one area near where I used to live, up in this place, Palos Verdes. I lived in Redondo down in the lowlands, but... There's an area of Palos Verdes called Portuguese Bend that's been sliding into the ocean for years and they keep fixing the road so you can keep going through. It's not moving fast, but it's slowly falling into the ocean. Number seven, opportunity. California ranks 49th in a stat they call opportunity. This is when you measure affordability, equality, and economic opportunity. The only one they beat was Louisiana. You know, it's not saying too much for your state when the only one preventing you from being dead last in any stat is Louisiana. That's like coming in second to last in a foot race. The only one you beat was a sumo wrestler in high heels dragging a sofa bed behind him by a strap around one ankle. Basically, what that stat is telling you, chances of you making a good life for yourself in California are slim at best. Number six, taxes. Taxes are one of the biggest complaints anyone has about any state. Taxes were originally a really good idea. Everyone gives a little bit of their money so they could fix things around town or maybe help support like the town's lonely old widow, something like that. Sometime around a day or two after taxes were a good idea, politicians got involved and they've sucked ever since. California politicians lost their collective minds. They have the highest income tax in the country and their sales tax is in the top 10 as worst, not good. And before you say it, stop typing. It's not just the liberals and the Democrats. Ronald Reagan, Pete Wilson, and Schwarzenegger didn't go light on taxes when they ran the state of California. Number five, crime. Crime may not be the worst in California, but it ain't good. When you have cities like East LA, Stockton, Fresno, Oakland, and even Compton, what do you expect? It actually would be considered the worst state on crime if they counted politicians ripping you off on every paycheck. Yeah, that would be, that would push them right over the top, I imagine. They'd blow past St. Louis and everyone. Number four, the shine is gone. The dream of California is over. Now, it's still a great state in a lot of ways. It's one of the biggest economies in the world, which means pretty much nothing to the average resident. The beaches are great. The wine is great. Disneyland. But the people have realized it's not worth the cost. The California life has always been somewhat of an illusion. When all we saw were movies and television, people thought the streets of California were paved in gold. Now that we have like the internet and things like YouTube, people see past the illusion. They see the real California and they see how much it costs to live in this state and all the problems and they're just going it's not worth it and they're moving out and they're moving on number three the homeless california has a lot of homeless people and that's just a fact You've got your standard homeless people that are hardcore living on the streets, and then you have a whole bunch of people in a lot of these cities that are living in their cars to save money, or they can't afford their rent. They're saving money for student loans, or whatever. I talked about this in a recent video. I mean, if you're going to be homeless, why not do it in a place that's got really good weather, you know? It only makes sense. But really, California does have a lot of homeless. Now, if you watch anything I've ever done on California, and then you look at the comments section, you'll see a whole bunch of people left comments about how there's poop in the streets of San Francisco. Now, there's a backstory to that. This all started with a story in the San Francisco Chronicle in 2014. Someone did a story about the streets with the most reports of poop, like reported to the city to have them come out and clean it. Now, the article didn't say it was just humans. The reports were of all droppings. Dogs, cats, humans, whatever. Now, this lady 
makes a map and puts it online. It was sort of in jest. You know, she was just making a joke, kind of, or, you know, mocking the situation. She posts this thing online. The story gets tossed around and the map gets tossed around from different websites for a couple of years and then Rush Limbaugh gets a hold of it. And he falsely claims that the map is a city project that was made because of the out of control poop problem. And that homeless people are pooping all over the streets and it's just bad. You can't even go down a street without it. And he just blew this thing out of proportion. Now, having poop in the streets is not a good thing. But the deal is this. You are going to have feces in the streets wherever you have homeless or pets or wild animals, whatever. It just happens. They don't have a bunch of readily available bathrooms for homeless people. We all have homes. That's where we go. They don't. It's going to happen. I've actually seen it in Oklahoma City. So it happens in all cities, not just San Francisco. You guys need to let it go. Quit listening to Rush Limbaugh. Number two, housing. House and rental prices are what's driving 30% of the people out of California. Back in the 80s, 90s, you just moved a couple miles east of the ocean and homes became affordable. That dream popped over 10 years ago. You have to keep going east to find affordable housing for the average blue collar worker now. You might end up going as far east as say, I don't know, Iowa or Mississippi to find affordable housing. And Slab City doesn't count. Quit bringing it up in the comment section. Every time I bring up California home prices, everyone says, not everyone, a bunch of people say, move to Slab City. Slab City is where, like, homeless people move to or people living off the grid. 99% of the population would never move there. But it is an interesting story, so I'd, you know, suggest Googling it. Give an example of how bad it got. Back around 2000, my uncle's a decorator, and he decorated and painted this house that was right on the beach in Redondo Beach, California. I mean, it wasn't even a house. It was a condo. And between you and the ocean was just sand and a set of stairs. It was right there. Back then, around 2000, 2001, it was going for $550,000. So we thought that was a lot of money, you know, half a million dollars, over half a million dollars. I looked it up. Currently, it's on the market the same place, you know, almost 20 years later. It's going for $1.8 million. This is a, you know, almost a studio apartment. This is like two bedrooms, I believe, a bathroom, a kitchen, and a living room, and the ocean view. That's incredible. And number one, the cost of living. The cost of living in California is obscene. There's no other way to put it. It's just gross. Now, granted, if you get away from the coast, it does get cheaper, like housing, but not much. Besides, about 70% of the people moving in or out of the Golden State are going to the coastal cities. So really, that's most of the focus on this video and almost any study on California migration. And this is the part of the video where people start leaving comments about how I'm bitter because I can't afford living in California anymore. Just to let you know, I can. There's a few places, Silicon Valley, San Francisco, Francisco, maybe Malibu, California, places like that, Beverly Hills, that I can't, but 80% of California, I could afford to live in decently. The thing is, myself and so many other people don't see the value in living in California anymore. Why spend that kind of money to live someplace that's overcrowded, has horrible air quality, and stands still traffic most any day in most any city? And all of you about to talk some trash, stop typing. Look at your next paycheck and see how much is going to the state of California. When you're done crying, call a moving company and head to Texas. All right, so that's my top 10 reasons people are leaving California. Hope you got some information out of it. Hope it was entertaining. Now, there's one other one that probably should have been on there because it's brought up a lot. And a lot of people say they don't want to move there because it's too liberal. I don't get that one. It's not like if you move to a place, the liberals force you to vote liberal. You know, that's just like, it doesn't make sense. Cost of living, you know, air quality, crowds, traffic, that all affects you. If someone's a liberal next door, why does it affect you? It doesn't make sense. I mean, if you're bothered by all the things that happen from their votes, I get it, but it just doesn't make sense to me. No one forces you to vote liberal if you move to any place or conservative or anything else. Anyway, I hope you guys enjoyed the video. Don't forget to leave a comment, hit that like button, subscribe if you haven't already done so. Everybody have a great day. Be nice to each other. I mean, if you're listing places not to move to, why don't we include the least friendly places. Let's take a look. Today, we explore the most unfriendly cities the United States has to offer here in 2023. 
Human beings theoretically should be friendly all the time. If that's how it was, we would all just have a much happier and easier lives. We could get things done and the world would work much smoother. But that isn't the reality. I mean, we're talking about human beings and when we get involved, it rarely works out the way it should. And then we find ourselves in the situation where we have a bunch of unfriendly people roaming our streets. In my experience, unfriendly people are usually dealing with some stuff. They're lonely, they have some mental issues, they have a rash on their undercarriage, or maybe they're Philadelphia Eagles fans and they haven't recovered from the Super Bowl 57 loss. God, that was a bad call at the end of that game. I'm not a Philly fan and I haven't recovered. But no matter where you go, you will find unfriendly people. In some places, those people are just easier to find. We ran a poll asking people what they felt the most unfriendly cities in the US were. I also left an optional section where they could leave reasons as to why they felt this was an unfriendly city or the people were unfriendly. And I'll tell you one thing I learned from that. There are a lot of people out there trashing entire cities because of bad relationships that ended poorly. There's a lot of angry women out there. So today we look at what 4,753 people felt were the most unfriendly cities in the US. Got it? Get it? Good. Let's take a look. Number 10, Oklahoma City. Oklahoma City is the capital of Oklahoma and it is known for its cowboy culture and its capital grounds like the Capitol building and they have working oil wells on the property. If you don't know, Oklahoma has a long history with oil. In my personal experience, I've never had a problem when I've gone to Oklahoma City. The people have been wonderful. Even they had friendly cops and I was doing some stupid shit with the drone. Now the comments section of any video that I've ever made about Oklahoma City, that's a different story. They get a little angry and I remember one man years ago claimed I had a cow turd for a brain. I don't know how he got a hold of my medical records, but I thought that was kind of rude. Some kind of HIPAA violation, I'm sure. Oklahoma City has a population of about 700,000 with the entire metro area having about 1.5. 5 million. And what it looks like is a lot of people think they're unfriendly, especially a woman named Carla who wrote, if you get involved with a man from Oklahoma City, you're just stupid. And then she put in parentheses, toxic masculinity. Number nine, Providence, Rhode Island. You know, this is really strange. I did a video just the other day and Providence showed up. I never talk about Providence. Here they are twice in one month. New England is a great place to live, but they sort of have a reputation for being a little rude and possibly unfriendly. The problem with Providence is they're also a little snobby. Providence doesn't have the greatest weather and I'm sure that plays a part in why people here are so unfriendly. Gray skies most of the year really works on someone's emotional state. I guess the gray skies were too much for this dude, so he painted his house bright orange. I don't know, that house makes me kind of happy. And that's not just because it's the same color of my car, my tool chest, my toaster, and most of my clothes. Yes, sometimes I leave the house dressed like orange sherbet. My wife won't go places with me on those days. Providence has a high cost of living, high taxes, and housing is sort of unaffordable here. So I'm sure that plays into why people are so unfriendly as well. One man named Mike K said the problem with Providence Rhode Island is the people just don't have time for you or being friendly. Said it's something they kind of take pride in. Number eight, Orlando, Florida. Now, this might surprise you because it's kind of known as the happiest place on earth with Disney World there. But the locals are very unfriendly. And that you'll find on this list has a lot to do with what goes on there. It's a tourist town. Locals love tourists because that's basically what pays their bills, but at the same time, they hate the tourists because a lot of tourists do stupid crap. And really, it's not just the locals. It's normally the parents that have to take their kids to Disneyland. The kids are having a good time, but the parents are thinking about how much it's costing them. And this makes people very unfriendly. You can find this unfriendliness in traffic, at cash registers, in two-hour lines for the teacups. Supermom Kelly wrote, I hate Disney. Disney. I hate the people at Disney. I hate thinking about Disney. If my kids ask me to go back, it takes everything I have not to cry. We went to Disney three years ago. I just finished paying it off. Yeah, so you can imagine Supermom Kelly is one of those unfriendly people you'd run into if you were visiting Orlando. Number seven, Los Angeles, California. Do you really need to throw the California in there? Is there another Los Angeles? I do 
automatically. I grew up in the Los Angeles metro area and I could tell you the biggest problem with the unfriendliness of Los Angeles, they're freaking snobby, terribly snobby. And this translates into an unfriendly experience for most out of towners. Oddly enough, the friendliest people in Los Angeles are normally the homeless people. They also seem to be the happiest people every time I run into them in LA. Now, this isn't the first time I've done a poll where people have brought up how unfriendly the people of Los Angeles are. You don't expect it. Los Angeles is warm weather, you know, sunshine all the time. We got beaches. You'd think we'd just be happy down there. No. Not at all. We look down our noses at everyone and we treat them in a very unfriendly manner. Now, obviously that's not everyone. I'm sure there's wonderful people in Los Angeles. I don't know many of them. I would say the odds of running into someone unfriendly are better than running into someone that's friendly in the Los Angeles metro area. Kyle wrote, if you want to see unfriendly people in Los Angeles, get on the 405 freeway at rush hour and that's all you'll see. Number six, Las Vegas, Nevada. Much like Orlando, Las Vegas has the same tourist problems. The locals understand that's where a lot of the money they make comes from, but they still gotta deal with the nonsense that tourists usually try and pull off whenever they're in Sin City. Even though it's called Sin City, everything is not legal. I know a few girls that have worked there at different bars and casinos, usually serving drinks or things like that, and they've all complained and said that every single time there's a convention in town, old businessmen from the middle of America seem to think that there's a magic word or a price that'll get you up to their room. One friend of mine, Michelle, said if the chances of you scoring with a 25-year-old girl back in Iowa are zero, your odds are the same in Las Vegas with a cocktail waitress. Las Vegas has a population of about 641,000 residents with the entire metro area having about 2.2 million residents. That's just the people that live there. On any given weekend, the number of people in Las Vegas and the metro area can almost double. Number five, Washington, D.C. The people of Washington, D.C. are very unfriendly, and that's just the politicians. The residents of Washington, D.C. tend to be a little rude as well. It's sort of overcrowded, they got traffic problems, they don't have the best weather, and they have to deal with a lot of garbage a lot of other cities don't have to deal with. And then you got the tourists. Tourists are there all year round. The city also has heightened security all the time, and this just kind of wears on you as well. It disrupts whatever you're doing. If you're traveling, driving around the city, you got to worry about that garbage. And on top of it, there's lobbyists and lawyers everywhere in this city, and they're just arrogant a-holes. But one of the biggest problems is the amount of police and security type people in Washington, D.C. is kind of incredible. If you've ever been there, it's, it's a little mind-blowing, and they don't really get trained in customer service that often. Ted said, the people and the going-ons of Washington, D.C. are an embarrassment to this country. Then he said, people in Washington, D.C. are rude and evil. That's a bit much, Ted. Number four, Detroit, Michigan. How could the people of Detroit not be unfriendly? I mean, horrible weather. City is just run down. It's dangerous. People that visit are in fear for their life. There aren't enough jobs to go around. This kind of makes people unfriendly. Detroit, you know, outside of summer is just one of those places where the sky is gray, gloomy, it rains or it snows. You're always cold. It's like ingredients for a unfriendly person cocktail. Detroit, it's estimated, has 632,000 residents. In 2020, they had 639,000. They have been hemorrhaging residents since the 1960s. When the city itself, not the metro area, maxed out at 1.8 million residents, residents. Now the entire metro area currently has about 4.3 million residents. That's including places like Dearborn, Plymouth, Pontiac, Warren, and a whole bunch of other places. But yeah, Detroit's just sort of a depressing city, and of course the people are going to be unfriendly. Joel Naper wrote, if you order an Uber in Detroit, you pray they show up in a Brinks truck. 
Number three, Boston Mass. You know what? Boston has a horrible history of rudeness. It's just the way they are. And a lot of it has to do with how they communicate. It's very aggressive and very much in your face. New Jersey shares the same thing. They may not see it as rude, but to outsiders, it seems very rude and unfriendly. Boston is also a very busy and expensive city, so that never makes people happy. Now, once you get outside of the inner city part and out to some of the suburbs, it's a little bit different, but downtown Boston and the immediate area around it, yeah, they're pretty rude. And it's weird. It's almost like they pride themselves on it. Boston also has the problem with a whole bunch of tourists. It's very much a historical touristy town. Jules said, it's better now with smartphones, but when I was a teenager in South Boston, tourists would always ask for directions and we would always send them in the wrong direction. What's funny about that, I grew up in a beach community in Southern California. When I was a kid, people would, hey, which way's the beach? You know, and they're like, four blocks away from the beach, we'd send them the other direction. Number two, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, known as the city of brotherly love. It really isn't. Philadelphia is almost an extension of New Jersey. New Jersey people are rude. I'm really shocked. None of the New Jersey cities made it onto this list. If we would have counted the top 20, they might have made the list. There wasn't that many things for like Trenton or Camden even. Camden's dangerous and unfriendly. Normally when something is dangerous, and your life's at risk, I'd consider it unfriendly. But here we are at Philadelphia. Philadelphia is another historical place with a lot of tourists. It also has some scary neighborhoods. If you're not from this part of the country, like Philly or anywhere in New Jersey and parts of New York, you probably don't know, but they drop the F-bomb like it's nothing. I've always akin it to how in California, people say dude or like all the time. Like Boston and what I was saying about New Jersey, it's just the way they communicate it seems rude to outsiders. Now, they kind of are unfriendly to tourists, just like any place that gets a lot of tourists, like we've gone over several times. The people of Philly are a little rough. That's just kind of their thing. Philadelphia is a big city. They've got a population of about 1.6 million residents. That's in the city alone. In the whole metro area, it's closer to 6.2. That's the seventh largest city in the United States. So there's a lot of potential there for running into some unfriendly people. Charlene wrote, never wear a New York Giants jersey, t-shirt, or hat here unless you really want to experience some unfriendly behavior. All right, before we get to number one, don't forget we have another channel called On This Day. There's a link for that channel below. All right, on to number one. And number one, New York City, New York. This is the poster child for rude and unfriendly. Their reputation for being unfriendly goes way, way back. And it's a little surprising considering how many people just have flooded here over the decades and decades. It's a giant melting pot. You think at some point they would learn to get along and be friendly with each other. It's not just outsiders they're unfriendly to. They're unfriendly to each other on a regular basis. It's just sort of their thing. The middle finger and the the F word are part of daily communication in New York City. On top of that, the weather isn't the greatest. They have an extremely high cost of living. And in my experience, almost everyone you run into in the tourist area always seem like they're working some kind of scam. It's really weird. I mean, you can find that anywhere, but I have never felt that as much as I do when I've gone to New York City. And that's unfriendly behavior. And don't expect to go into like retail places or restaurants and get some friendly service there. No, customer service really isn't much of a thing in New York City. You really go into a restaurant and they kind of treat you like you're lucky they're there and you're lucky they let you in. New York City is the most populated city we have in the United States. It's also the most densely populated city. They had 8.8 .8 million residents in the 2020 census, and right now, in 2022, it's estimated that they've lost about 400,000 residents. It's still too crowded. The entire metro area has like 20 million residents. When people live on top of each other, it's not a good thing. You get a lot of crime, you get a lot of extra BS, and a lot of unfriendly and rude people. Just how it is. And my favorite response through this whole thing was from a guy named Lou. All he said was, it's New York City, no sh All right, this one's from just last year. It's about Houston, Texas. Why are Houstonians fleeing Houston like somebody just outlawed the word y'all within the city limits? Texans can put up with a lot, but getting rid of y'all might push some of them over the edge. 
So why are people leaving? It's a good question. Houston has almost always gained in population, like every single year. 2021 and 2022 is one of the only times in their history they've seen back-to-back -back drops in population. Minus 0.7% in 2021 and minus 1.1% in 2022. That doesn't sound like a big number, but it is. It's kind of shown a trend. In the last two census, the city has gained less than 10% which has only happened three times since 1850, with most decades seeing growth around 30% and up. Now, when you get down and look at the numbers, you could see that people are still moving in from other states at about the normal rate. It's just the longtime residents are leaving Houston faster than ever before. Most of the Houstonians leaving the city moved to other Texas metro areas, Dallas, San Antonio, Austin, and Beaumont. After that, they're moving out of state to Denver, Atlanta, and Los Angeles. So why is this happening? Why are more and more Houstonians packing up and moving on? And that's what we're looking at today, the reasons people leaving Houston gave in a survey as to why they wanted a new place to call home. Got it? Get it? Good. Let's take a look. Number 10, the weather. Yeah, a lot of people don't like the weather in Houston, and I've been there quite a few times, and I gotta agree with them. The weather sucks in Houston, especially in the summer. Houston is known for its hot, humid weather, which can be uncomfortable and even dangerous during the summer months. According to the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, the average temperature in Houston in July is 94.5 degrees Fahrenheit, with a whole bunch of humidity. If you've never been to Houston and you're just imagining Houston is like West Texas, it's not. West Texas is like a desert. Houston is like a swamp. If you're one of those people like myself that likes a little cool weather, you're not going to get much of it in Houston. The winter does get kind of nice and a little bit cold now and then, but the summers are brutal along with the mosquitoes that go with them. It's just kind of harsh. And on top of that, you got the extreme weather events, hurricanes, flooding. Houston's had their fair share of them. They've also seen a few tornadoes and some serious thunderstorms. The flooding seems to happen every year. Then, I don't know, every 10 years or so, a major hurricane blows through that place and just upsets the whole city. But there is one amazing thing about Houstonians when that happens. I've never been there for one, but the news is just filled with people helping each other out. They get through it together. So you got to like that. But yeah, a lot of people, they just can't take the weather and they bail on Houston. Number nine, the traffic. The traffic in Houston is getting worse every single year. Maybe the fact that they're losing some people might change that, but they've been growing at such a good pace for so long that the infrastructure's really not been able to keep up. It's almost like the city planners are watching how the city's growing and think, you know what, we need a new four-lane interstate right here and we'll, you know, have it do this and this and this. And then when they finish it eight years later, they're all, you know, we should have made that eight lanes each direction. I've been stuck in Houston traffic about three or four times. It's not as bad as Los Angeles or let's say the Bay Area, San Francisco, but it's pretty close. Number eight, social issues. Now, some things kept popping up and I thought each one was important, but they weren't important enough to have their own spot on this list. So I kind of clumped them all together. Social issues. A lot of people complain that they feel socially isolated. Despite its size, Houston can be a difficult place to meet new people and build a social network. Some residents feel isolated and disconnected from the community. There's many complaints on how it's really hard to date in Houston, and there's a few reasons for that. One of them is there's more women than men. Now, if you're a person looking for a woman to bump uglies with, this is a good thing. You have more choices than you might other places. Like in Alaska, where it's like one woman to every five guys or something like that. Houston's not that bad, but it's enough to where it's noticeable. I've seen different stats for it, but it's usually something like if you take 100 people in Houston, there's 55 women for every 45 men. Some of the problems with this is if you're a woman and you're looking for a man, your options are limited. Years ago, I did a video and brought this up, and I remember reading this article, and this one woman in there said, don't move to Houston if you're married, because some woman will try and steal your man. You put in parentheses, men are in short supply in Houston. So that could be a problem. You also have diversity. Houston is a very diverse city, but some residents may not appreciate the cultural differences or feel uncomfortable in multicultural environments. Now, whenever you bring up diversity on any kind of video, and you're talking about social things, and you'll have a bunch of comments in the comment section about diversity is not a good thing. Just enjoy those and get a good chuckle out of it. They always try and include fake stats. 
Number seven, pollution. Houston has high levels of air pollution due to its large size and petrochemical facilities that basically surround the entire city. According to the American Lung Association, Houston ranks as the 12th most polluted city in the United States for year-round particle pollution. Basically, air quality sucks here. On top of that, when you have bad air quality, that usually leads into you got bad water quality. Now, their water is not dangerous, but I've read a bunch of things where it tastes bad. You're moving from out of the area, you'll move to Houston, you'll taste the water, and you'll be buying bottled water from that point on. Side note, Los Angeles has the same problem. I never knew how nice water out of a tap tasted until I left Los Angeles. But believe it or not, the air pollution and water quality really bothers a lot of people. It's bad enough when it's hot, humid, and then you just suck it in some exhaust. Number six, the crime. Houston's got some crime. Actually, it is the worst when it comes to crime of all the Texas metro areas. They've got both property crime and violent crime. They say their property crime is 85% higher than the national average, which sucks. But where they're really putting the extra effort in is the violent crime rate. That's about 224% above the national average. That's the 2022 numbers. In 2020, they were only 211% above the national average. So if you're worried about crime, yeah, you could look at those numbers and probably want to leave Houston. Every time I've been to Houston, as I've driven around, I've thought, wow, I bet there's a lot of crime going on around here. Why doesn't that car have any tires? I actually saw a guy stealing a chain link fence. It's not like he worked for some company. This was strictly off the books, and he was taking that chain link fence home, I believe, because most workers don't use a shopping cart to transport parts of a fence. Number five, limited public transportation. Yeah, Houston's public transportation system sort of sucks. It's definitely not as extensive or reliable as some of the other cities of the United States. Houston's not even in the top 25. And on top of that, it's ranked really low when it comes to walkability. Houston is a sprawling city that's not really pedestrian friendly, which can make it challenging to get around without a car. So the public transportation sucks and it's too big to walk around. Who's in charge of this city? Number four, limited job opportunities. Houston has jobs. It's not like they're really hurting for jobs. They just don't have a wide variety of jobs. They have a strong economy and it's home to many major companies in industries such as oil and gas, healthcare, and technology. Outside those industries, it could be a little dicey and a little limited. So if you work in IT, great, you can probably get a job. Healthcare, probably. Oil and gas, sure. R-rated magician at a retirement home, maybe not. Now, whenever I talk about this subject right here, there's a few cities in the United States that are like this. Actually, there's a few states that are like this. They're heavy in a couple different industries, but not a bunch of different industries. Like California, you could find anything. Just about any industry is well represented in California. It's also in Dallas. Dallas is pretty good. Atlanta has a strong market in different industries. But Houston's just a city that has a lot of jobs in just a few different industries. That's why a lot of people listed career change as the reason they left Houston. Probably changed careers and didn't find a new one there. Number three, high cost of living. This is something people put down a lot. It's at the number three spot. The statistical reality is Houston's not that bad when you compare it to other major cities in the United States. But I have a theory on this one that I have no proof of. I'm just assuming. Houston is down there in South Texas near Louisiana. So it's Southeast Texas. Louisiana's dirt cheap. And after Louisiana, you have Mississippi, which is, I don't know, what's lower than dirt cheap. And a lot of the people that do end up in Houston, let's say for a handful of years for work or whatever, come from Louisiana, Mississippi, Alabama. Matter of fact, after Hurricane Katrina in 2005, a lot of people from the New Orleans area and really all of Louisiana moved to Houston. But it's not just after a hurricane that people start heading to Houston. Houston has been in the top 10 list for people relocating from Louisiana since 1996. I'm sure before then, but that's how far back the list goes. Houston's the biggest metro area outside Louisiana, so it only makes sense. It's a no-brainer. But yeah, that's my theory. People that are coming from Louisiana and parts of the Deep South, they get to Houston and they get a little sticker shock. 
Number two, it's poorly planned. Most cities have a rhythm to them. They're planned out properly. You know what to expect. You're in a residential area. You expect homes, maybe a condo, maybe an apartment building. You go to an area where there's a bunch of apartment buildings. You'll find a bunch of apartment buildings, maybe a house or two. Drive down a main strip and you have a mini mall, maybe an office building. Houston's got their own agenda. This right here is a perfect example. You have these nice duplexes or whatever they are, like condos, and directly across the street, they just built like a 25 story office building. That's a residential street. Back in 2018, I did a video about Houston and I found out this is one of the biggest complaints people from Houston and people moving to Houston, pretty much everybody, complained about. But back to that giant building, that residential neighborhood, even if half of it or all of its apartments and not just an office building, it's too big for that neighborhood. Another complaint people have about Houston is lack of green spaces. They don't have a lot of parks and they don't have any, you know, like wooded areas with hiking trails. They just don't go into that. If they did and knowing how they planned out their city, you might be on a five mile hike into the woods and find a Starbucks all by itself. Round the bend and you might find the last pager dealership in the country. I miss pagers. It was so much harder to get a hold of me back then. I've been paging you for like three days. Huh, I, I didn't get the page. I don't know what's going on. Yeah, but that's one of the biggest complaints people have is the city's confusing. All right, before we get to number one, if you're looking to move to Houston or any place in the United States, there's a link for a website called Home and Money. They have all kinds of tools for people looking to buy a new home, get you in touch with a real estate agent, all that good stuff. All right, on to number one. And number one, political polarization. Politics has become very toxic here in the United States in the last handful of years. It's a real problem in Texas. This was the number one complaint people had about Houston in that survey. People don't worry about crime as much as they worry about having to listen to someone and their political views. I think part of what plays into people responding like this is the friction that they have between Texans and Californians moving to Texas. Houston doesn't get nearly as many Californians as Dallas, Fort Worth, and San Antonio does, but they get enough. How about Nevada? Let's take a look. Today, I'm going to tell you why when you take a road trip through Nevada, you'll see more lonely truck stops than you will towns. That's right, the Silver State only has 3 million residents, with almost 70% of them living in one of the state's metro areas. That metro area is Las Vegas, and if it wasn't for Sin City, I am sure Nevada would be the least populated state in the country. There are many reasons Nevada has such a low population, and only a few of them have to do with owing the wrong people some money. Today, we look at the 10 reasons Nevada is kind of vacant. Got it? Get it? Good. Let's take a look. Number 10, Mother Nature. Nevada is mostly an arid desert, which makes living conditions harsh and uncomfortable for most people. If you've got a few too many extra pounds and a wool scarf collection you like to wear, even more so. The summer heat in Nevada can be sweltering, with temperatures often exceeding 100 degrees Fahrenheit. On top of that, Nevada is prone to natural disasters such as wildfires, flash floods, and earthquakes. Yeah, it's not just California that gets the earthquakes, Nevada feels them too. They have another natural disaster that's seldom talked about, and I've noticed it, it's grown men crying while they wait to board a flight home. You know, Vegas especially has a lot of homeless people, and I find it amazing that anyone would be homeless in that kind of heat. If I got to live like that, I'm going to do it in the Pacific Northwest where I can get a tent and get out of the rain and cold. Not like you can carry a air conditioner in a backpack or a shopping cart. Number nine, it's dry as a bone. With very little rainfall and next to no surface water, Nevada has limited water resources, which makes it challenging to support a large and still growing population. They are forever in a drought situation. 90% of the state's a freaking desert. This should be expected. And before you do stop typing, I know the Western states have had record rain and snowfall over the last couple months. It's still going on. As I'm recording this, they're about to get hit by another storm. This should ease up the drought for a couple years years, I'd say. Lake Mead is fed by the Colorado River, which is the main source of water for the Las Vegas metro area, basically most of southern Nevada. The Colorado River is fed by the Rockies, and the Rockies got record snowfall so far. It's still happening. This will help Lake Mead. It's not going to help it forever. It's not like they're going to have storms like this next year and the following year. It's a desert, and they have too many people taken from the Colorado River. In a year or two, Lake Mead's going to drop back down again. On the northern side of the state, where you got Reno, Lake Tahoe, and a handful of 
other lakes, they're going through the same thing. Record snowfall, the lakes are filling up, but like Lake Mead, it'll get back down to its normal drought status eventually. Number eight, high cost of living. The cost of living in Nevada is relatively high, especially in the urban areas like Las Vegas and Reno. A lot of that has to do with so many people moving to those areas over the last couple decades, I would say, especially Californians. Not just you, Idaho. It's Nevada, Oregon, and everyone else is getting Californians. Californians basically got priced out of their own state, so they start moving to other states, and now those states are getting expensive. It's a cycle that we go through all the time. For decades and decades, California was being filled up with people from other states. That's how they got so expensive. Human beings will move from place to place looking for an easier way to live. Back before we had money, human beings followed the herds and moved to warmer climates during the winter. Now that we don't have to kill woolly mammoths, we follow jobs and cheaper real estate. But because of the migration to Nevada over the last few decades, they've gotten very expensive. Depending on what study you look at, in 2003, Nevada was ranked 23rd with median home listing price. In 2022, they were ranked 14th. Number seven, limited job opportunities. Now, they do have jobs in Nevada. That's a fact. They just don't have a whole bunch of industries. The state's economy is largely based on tourism and gaming, which may not provide enough job opportunities for everyone. The federal government owns a lot of the land in this state, and they have a lot of installations. They have jobs, just they're not that diverse when it comes to the jobs. And this spooks a lot of people. And especially if you're just going off reputation and what you sort of know about Nevada, you think everything's casinos there. They do have other jobs, just not massive amounts in other industries like you'd find in California, Texas, Oregon, Washington, and Colorado. But before you guys complain, listen to the words that I said. They have plenty of jobs, just not a lot of different kinds of jobs on a massive scale. Number six, sparse infrastructure. When it comes to basic services and infrastructure, Nevada ain't got much outside a few major cities. Many parts of Nevada have limited access to public services, including healthcare, education, and transportation. Lack of healthcare infrastructure is a big deal for retirees. For you 20-year-olds out there, as you get older, you have to go to the doctor a lot more, and sometimes it includes specialists. And if you're living in the Nevada outback with a three-hour ride to a hospital, it could get really uncomfortable. Nevada's healthcare is kind of rated poorly, and it's not because they're doing bad work or they have bad hospitals. Accessibility is a big factor when they're grading healthcare, and Nevada doesn't have a lot of access. Great hospitals, great nurses and doctors, staff, all that's terrific. They just don't have enough of it. And it makes sense. They're not going to throw up a hospital someplace that services 1,200 people in an area the size of Los Angeles County. And like I've said before, infrastructure is not just roads, bridges, and train tracks. Internet accessibility, healthcare, schools, fire stations, hospitals, that's all part of infrastructure. Number five, high crime. Nevada has some crime. Most of it's happening in the Las Vegas metro area, but they have enough there to really make the whole state look bad. Don't get me wrong, other parts of the state do have some crime, but a vast majority of it's gonna be happening around Las Vegas. Go to Vegas for a while, stand around. Seems like everyone's got a scam going on. When I say go to Vegas, you'll see that. Go downtown, go to the Strip, that's where you'll see it. You're not gonna be standing in the parking lot of an elementary school and some guy's gonna try and steal your wallet. Not saying that's never happened. Those first grade teachers got sticky fingers. In 2022, Nevada was ranked fifth in the nation for crime. They had a violent crime rate that was 541 per every 100,000 residents. Their imprisonment rate was 584 adults for every 100,000. That's 13th highest in the nation. Number four, bad reputation. So this one's kind of strange, but a lot of people have misconceptions of what's really going on in Nevada. You have some pearl clutchers out there that just can't get past the fact they have gambling, drinking, hourly company for a price, and strip clubs. Now, that's a little unfair to Nevada because there's so much more to this state than just Las Vegas and slot machines. Every state has its stereotype or something everyone thinks about it. And a lot of times it's sort of a delusional stereotype. Once you get out of Vegas, Laughlin and Reno, you're not going to see giant casinos, maybe down on state line. Most of the state is small, out of the way desert towns. It's almost like here in Portland. The rest of Oregon's like another country. Outside of Las Vegas, the rest of Nevada is like another country. Totally different. 
Number three, they got a late start. There was really nothing in Nevada prior to the Hoover Dam. Construction started in 1931 and was completed in 1936. And that brought the first large group of people to Nevada. In the early days when settlers were coming west, they really didn't stop in Nevada because the environment was too harsh. Wyoming had the same problem. There were better options in nearby states. Nevada had small towns here or there, but really nothing big. I mean, the Las Vegas metro area had about 5,000 people. Nevada's biggest city in 1930s was Reno, and they had about 18,000 people. Carson City only had 1,500. At that same time, Los Angeles had over a million people, 1.2. Number two, remote location. Nevada is relatively isolated from other major population centers, which may discourage people from living there. And that showed up a lot on the survey. People kept saying how remote it is and how far away it is from everything. And I kind of get it. You look at the map and Nevada is bordered by the eastern part of California, which that's a very sparsely populated part of California. Their second biggest area is Reno, and Reno, again, it's on the border with the eastern side of California, out in the mountains, where we don't have any really big cities out there. In the north, it borders Idaho and Oregon. Idaho has Twin Falls kind of close. That's really not a big city, but it's bordering the part of Oregon where pretty much no one lives. Same goes for Utah to the east. The fact that Nevada has few major highways and airports was brought up a lot too. One thing I did find interesting, almost every major airport in the United States has a direct flight to Las Vegas. But that one was a little bit weird that people kept bringing it up. I mean, I get it, but I don't think it's that big of a deal. All right, before we get to number one, if you're thinking about moving to Nevada, there's a link for Home and Money down below. It's a website filled with tools and information if you're thinking about relocating and buying a house someplace. It'll also help you get in contact with a real estate agent wherever you're moving to. All right, on to number one. And number one. The government owns it. Yeah, that's right. The government owns large portions of Nevada, and that's why you don't have a lot of extra towns springing up. People don't have as many options as you'd think they would to buy land. I mean, you look at a state like Nevada, it's sparsely populated, a lot of open land. You'd think, hey, I could just buy some land, sit on it, whatever you want to do, right? Maybe use it for rabbit hunting, snake hunting, who knows? But the federal government owns about 81% of Nevada's land. Now, when I say owned, I use that loosely. The federal government land is managed for many purposes, such as conservation and development of natural resources, grazing and recreation. But they do own 81.07% of Nevada's total land. That that's about 56 million acres, almost 57. The state only has 70 million acres. Of that 81.07%, 63% is managed by the Bureau of Land Management, or BLM. We talked about them in a recent video where you could buy a pass for $25 a month. So if you've got a camper and you want to go live out in the middle of the desert, live that van life, you could pay $25 a month and park someplace in the middle of the desert. There's a lot of people out there doing it right now. A friend of mine, Alyssa Vanilla, she has a YouTube channel for that. I'll leave a link down below. She stays on BLM land all the time. But that's another reason not that many people live out in Nevada. They just don't have as much land as you think they might. Because it's owned by Uncle Sam. This one's about violence. Every single state. Welcome back to the world according to Briggs in a video about violence. Yes, we're ranking the states by their violent nature, sort of. Have you ever wondered where your state stacks up when ranking the most dangerous, the most violent? Dangerous and violent are often considered the same thing, but the dangerous one, when they do a study like this, they include things like highway safety, workplace injuries, and a few other things. We're not concerned with the chances of you getting your tailbone injured because your friend on the forklift accidentally tried to check your prostate. In this video, we are ranking the states by felony assault or worse, like murder and everything in between. This video is ranked by how many violent crimes per 100,000 residents a state sees every year. And just so you know, the national average is 366 per 100,000 residents. We are ranking them from the safest, like Disneyland safe, to the most dangerous, like Omaha Beach. 
Now, before we get going, let me know in the comment section below where you think your state is gonna rank. Is it gonna be the 10s, the 20s, the 30s, the 40s? What's it gonna be? In this video, we are including the District of Columbia. We also have the number of violent crimes reported. Just to kind of give you an idea, it really has no bearing on the ranking because that's just a number of how many times something happened. And if you know nothing about statistics, you just know the more people you're gonna have, the more you're gonna have of something. So the most populated states, cities, towns or whatever are always going to have more crimes reported. Like I always say, more people means more problems. This video is based on FBI numbers published in 2022. Got it? Get it? Good. Let's take a look. Number 51, Maine. Imagine that. Maine is the safest state in the union yet again. And yes, 51. Like I've said before, we're including the District of Columbia because a lot of people do consider it a state even though it's not. And when it comes to violent crime rates, <laughs> they get on the list. Maine just doesn't do violence. I mean, they do some hunting. They even had a battle here called the Battle of Caribou with the Canadians back in 1830-something. It was a bloodless battle. I shouldn't say bloodless. There was a bear killed and I think a guy injured by a bear. So they face off in the woods and they're all camped out. And apparently a black bear wanders into the Canadian camp. There's a big to-do about it and they start shooting at the bear. So during that confusion, the Americans cross the way, think they're shooting at them, so they start shooting back. So now the Canadians are being attacked by a bear and the Americans are shooting at them. They were probably totally confused. They left the area and figured the Americans figured out how to use black bears in an attack. The violent crime rate in Maine is 108.6 for every 100,000 residents. That's less than a third the national average. The total violent crimes reported or violent crime incidents, 1,466. That ranks them 20th in the nation. They don't have a lot of people, so. 50, New Hampshire. New Hampshire, right next to Maine. It's a lot like Maine, just like it's a lot like Vermont. I'm sure the people from those states will probably say, oh, there's a big difference. To outsiders, not much of a difference. I don't know if it's too cold to commit crime in New England, but there isn't a lot of it going on here in New Hampshire or Maine. The violent crime rate in New Hampshire is 146.4 for every 100,000 residents. The number of violent crime incidents, 2,000 even. That ranks them 49th in the nation. 49, Vermont. I love Vermont for many different reasons. One of my favorites is a political reason. This is a very liberal state, but they like their guns. Actually, there's a few liberal states that they really, you know, enjoy their guns and they like to have them and... They don't care what everyone else thinks. But in Vermont, they really ain't using those guns on each other. Their violent crime rate is 173.4 for every 100,000 residents. Total number of violent crimes in Vermont, 1,081. That puts them 51st in the nation. There's really nothing going on there violence-wise. Number 48, Connecticut. One of the best crime stories I ever heard about Connecticut in Hartford one time, a woman had some sort of ice cream truck and this guy came in to rob her. She didn't have any money. So he made her sit in the truck while he sold a bunch of ice cream. So she had enough for him to rob. When he finally collected enough cash, I guess he left. And then the news was there to talk to everyone. And this lady was all, you know, he did seem a little rough around the edges, but he was really nice to everyone. I mean, if she knew about the woman that was being held captive in the ice cream truck, she would have sung a different tune. But the violent crime rate in Connecticut is 181.6 for every 100 100,000 residents. Their violent crime rate incidents, now it's a bigger state as far as population goes, so they had quite a few, 6,459, ranking them 38th in the nation. 47, New Jersey. Surprise, surprise. This is one of those things that I think a lot of people have a image of what goes on in New Jersey because of shows and movies and stuff like that. The reality is outside the major cities in New Jersey, it's a beautiful state. They got some really rundown cities where most of their crime is going on. And I think the fact that, you know, the Sopranos were done in New Jersey is kind of giving people an image of what's going on in the state. Nothing like that. They like their diners and they like to talk to you real close, like way too close. It's weird. The violent crime rate in New Jersey is 195.4 for every 100,000 residents. Their violent crime incidents reported 17,353. That ranks them 26th in the nation. 46, Virginia. Now, one thing I want to make clear again, what we're ranking this on is their violent crime rate. That's the first number I'm giving you. The second one, I'm just kind of throwing it in there, letting you know where they stand on total crimes. Virginia is a place that's really not known for having any 
bad cities. I mean, nothing jumps out at you like a Detroit or a Chicago, St. Louis, Baton Rouge, things like that. Nothing jumps out at you. They do have some crime, not a whole bunch, but they do have some. The violent crime rate in Virginia is 208 for every 100,000 residents. Their violent crime incidents, 17,925. That ranks them 25th of the nation. 45, Rhode Island. Rhode Island, interesting state. It's small and everyone just thinks it's the size of a postage stamp and nobody really lives there. 99% of the population lives in Providence and it's a good sized city. It takes up almost a quarter of the entire state. We have a subscriber that lives in Fall River, Massachusetts, and the state line basically kind of goes through town there. He lives in Massachusetts. His in-laws across the street live in Rhode Island. Thought that was interesting. Providence does have some crime, though. Their violent crime rate is 230.8 for every 100,000 residents. That's still well below the national average, but like 95% of the crime in Rhode Island comes from Providence. The violent crime incidence was 2,440. That puts them at 48th in the nation. 44, Wyoming. Yeah, you know, this is kind of proof if everyone's got guns, fewer people pull them on each other. The violent crime rate in Wyoming is 234.2 for every 100,000 residents. I promise you, most of the violent crime that goes on here, it has to do with drinking and assaulting someone, that type thing. The violent crime incident is 1,364. That ranks them 50th in the nation. 43, Idaho. A lot like Wyoming. The same type of people, the same type of laws. It's just their thing. Go try and rob like a restaurant in Wyoming, like one of the ones off the side of the road. I promise you, half the people in there have guns and are willing to put a hole in you. The violent crime rate in Idaho is 242.6 for every 100,000 residents. And their violent crime incidents, 4,432, ranking them 44th of the nation. 42, Hawaii. Hawaii, you know, people really don't get shot there too often or anything like that. They don't have a lot of gun violence. What they do have is a lot of violence on the, like people having enough of each other, road rage, punching each other in the face, things like that. The violent crime rate in Hawaii is 254.2 for every 100,000 residents. Their violent crime incidents, 3,576, putting them at number 46 in the nation. 41, Kentucky. I'm a little surprised on this one. I thought it would be much higher, but I get the feeling out in the backwoods of Kentucky, they don't really call the sheriff for much. I'm sure it's a lot better these days, but Kentucky and West Virginia and Tennessee, back in the day, a lot of people were the victims of small town justice. The violent crime rate in Kentucky is 259.1 per every 100,000 residents. The violent crime incidence is 11,600, ranking them 32nd in the nation. Number 40, Utah. I thought we would have seen them earlier. They just really don't seem to be doing much violent crime out in Utah, but here they are. The violent crime rate in Utah is 260.7 for every 100,000 residents. Their violent crime incidents was 8,471, ranking them 35th of the nation. Minnesota. I've told this story before, but it's great, so I'm telling it again. I was uh, reading this article about a guy who had been shot over a fish or something in Minnesota, and they were talking to a local guy, and they said, there's a lot of people been beat up over musky exaggerations. <laughs> That's a fish, but it just seems ridiculous to be saying that. The violent crime rate in Minnesota is 277.5 for every 100,000 residents. Their violent crime incidence is 15,698, putting them at 28th in the nation. 38, Mississippi. If Mississippi was smaller, I'm sure this would be a lot higher because Jackson, Mississippi is an extremely violent city. It's just they have a lot of rural areas that they don't have a bunch of crime out there. The violent crime rate in Mississippi is 291.2 for every 100,000 residents. Their violent crime incidence is 8,638, putting them at number 34 for the nation. 37, Oregon. I was looking back on the history of this. I moved up to Oregon 13 years ago, which was 2010. They did this same study back then, and Oregon was the fifth safest state when it comes to violent crime. Not so much these days. The violent crime rate in Oregon is 291.9 for every 100,000 residents. Their violent crime incidents, 12,380, putting them at number 31 in the nation. 
Number 36, Washington. Yep, staying in the same area, you got Washington. Washington is a really good state to live in these days. It's the weirdest thing. We got all these people that think it's not, and they're very vocal about it on my videos. Whatever they say is wrong about the state, their numbers never seem to add up to what's really going on in the state. Strange. The violent crime rate in Washington is 293.7 for every 100,000 residents, and their violent crime incidents, 22,596, putting them 19th in the nation. 35, Iowa. You ever been to Iowa? Stay there about a week and you'll be looking for some violent crime just to spice things up and kill some of the boredom. Violent crime rate in Iowa is 303.5 for every 100,000 residents. Their violent crime incidents, 9,601. That puts them at 33rd in the nation. Number 34, Ohio. You know, I thought Ohio would be a lot later in this list, especially with Cleveland and Dayton and Cincinnati. The violent crime rate in Ohio is 308.8 for every 100,000 residents. Violent crime incidents, 36,104. That puts them 11th in the nation for overall, but they got some major cities, so it's to be expected. 33, Massachusetts. You know, I'm a little surprised at this one too. Boston's one of those cities you expect to get punched in the mouth for saying some stupid stuff. But I guess they ain't killing each other in the streets as often, so that's good. The violent crime rate in Massachusetts is 308.8, just like Ohio, with their violent crime incidents being 21,288. 32, Wisconsin. You know, from what I know of Wisconsin and what I've seen in Wisconsin, this all has to be coming from Milwaukee because everyone there is just pleasant. The violent crime rate in Wisconsin is 323.4 for every 100,000 residents. Their violent crime incidents, 18,861. They're ranked 23rd in the nation in overall violent crime incidents. 31, North Dakota. You know, I don't know if I'm surprised at this one or not surprised. Kind of right here in the middle. Makes sense. You never hear of too much crime going on in North Dakota. You never hear of it being a terribly safe place to live. There's kind of average, I guess. The violent crime rate in North Dakota is 329 for every 100,000 residents. And the violent crime incidence is 2,518, putting them at 47th in the nation. 30, Nebraska. Nebraska is one of those states I think they should have uh, like at least a sign of a cop as you enter the state that says nothing to see here folks keep moving keep moving the violent crime rate in Nebraska is 334.1 for every 100,000 residents and their violent crime incidents 6,473 putting them at number 37 in the nation 29 West Virginia yeah, I am surprised at this one. I think their biggest problem, though, is the addiction issues to opioids and other things like that. I don't think they're really big on assaulting each other or anything like that. Their crimes just seem to be involving substance abuse. The violent crime rate in West Virginia is 355.9 for every 100,000 residents. And the violent crime incidents, 6,352. It puts them 39th in the nation. 28, Indiana. So here we are almost at the national average mark of 366. Everything about Indiana is average. If you look at the poverty rate, it's always average. Cost of living, average. This is like where the United States bases everything on. If you're better than Indiana, outstanding. If you're worse than Indiana, oh my God, what's the matter with you? I swear they're always in the middle. That's why we never hear about Indiana on this channel. They're never good enough to get on a positive list and they are really never that negative so they don't end up on places that suck lists. Their violent crime rate is 357.7 for every 100,000 residents. Their violent crime incidents, now they have some pretty big cities, so that's kind of high, 24,161, putting them at the 18th spot. You know, with Gary, Indiana and Indianapolis, I thought for sure they'd be higher on this list. 27, New York. Now, I'm sure a lot of you just groaned and thought, no way, New York's one of the worst in the nation. Eh, really, the numbers show that it's not. Like every state, it has some places that should be avoided at all costs. But overall, the state's, you know, middle of the road. The violent crime rate in New York is 363.8 for every 100,000 residents. And the violent crime incidents, 70,330. 39, putting them at fourth of the nation for overall. Makes sense. They're one of the largest states in population. Now, if you were to go back to the late 70s, early 80s, it would be a different story entirely. New York was at its worst then, and that was, you know, 40 something years ago, but they've done an incredible job of getting to where they are today. It's not perfect, but it's definitely a lot better than it used to be. 
26, Florida. I would have expected the Sunshine State to have a little more violence, but here they are at number 26. Not bad. The violent crime rate in Florida is 383.6 for every 100,000 residents. Violent crime incidents, 83,368, putting them at number three in the nation. 25, Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania's two major cities, Pittsburgh and Philadelphia, uh, you know, they're not the safest cities in the world, but they're definitely not horrible. I mean, Kensington in Philadelphia is horrible. The rest, not that bad. Now, when I say that, please don't compare it to the small town you're from. I'm comparing it to the other major cities in this country that are in really bad shape. But Pennsylvania's violent crime rate is 389.5 for every 100,000 residents, and their violent crime incidents, 49,793. 24, Maryland. You know, with Baltimore, you'd expect them to be a little higher up on the list, but here they are at 24. I think it's because the rest of the state is pretty mellow. The violent crime rate in Maryland is 399.9 for every 100,000 residents. Their violent crime incidents, 24,215, putting them at number 17 in the nation. Now, one thing I want to remind you is we're looking at felony violent crimes, like assaults that someone seriously got injured. Not like the girl who, <laughs> I just read about this, uh, she threw a drink at a guy's face like old school bar. The guy's being rude. She got arrested for assault. Number 23, Georgia. I'm a little shocked. I mean, Atlanta's got some spots, but you know, most of the state's not terrible. The violent crime rate in Georgia is 400.1 for every 100,000 residents and the violent crime incidents, 42,850. 22, North Carolina. Yeah, I'm a little shocked at this one. Uh, what does North Carolina got that's really bad or dangerous? Charlotte's not terrible. Raleigh-Durham area isn't horrible either. Fayetteville kind of blows, but it's not terrible. Must be an overall type of thing. The violent crime rate in North Carolina is 419.3 for every 100,000 residents. The violent crime incidents, 44,451. Puts them at number nine in the nation. 21, Colorado. The Centennial State shows up at 21. Uh, you know, I'm trying to think where all theirs is coming from. Denver, it's got some spots you should probably avoid. Boulder, extremely safe. Colorado Springs is pretty safe. Pueblo, maybe not. Maybe that's where it's all coming from. Anyway, the violent crime rate in Colorado is 423.1 for every 100,000 residents. The violent crime incidents, 24,570, putting them at number 16. Number 20, Kansas. How did this happen, Kansas? You used to be a beacon on the hill of prosperity and calm. Now you're out there assaulting each other. I guess you got to do something to break up the monotony. Someplace in Kansas, I forget where, but during the 2020 election, they were talking about how heated things were getting, and someone brought up the fact that there was a guy in a local pub in Kansas, and he had had a discussion about politics with some of the other people at the bar. Well, when he got up to leave, as he was hitting the door, someone threw a beer mug and hit him in the back of the head, split his head open. He had to get a bunch of stitches. And from what I know about Kansas, they're still talking about that every day. The violent crime rate in Kansas is 425 for every 100,000 residents. The violent crime incidence is 12,835, ranking them 30 in the nation. Number 19, Illinois. I know a lot of you just spit your drink out. Illinois, why aren't they number one? They've got Chicago. Well, like we've talked about before, Chicago does have the most crime, as you'll see in a minute, but they have so many people, their rate is fairly low for the reputation they have. I mean, they're number 19 on this list. Not trying to make it sound like they have no crime, but compared to how many people they have, they're not doing that bad. It's not just Chicago either. Rockford, horrible. Saw a comedian years ago from Rockford, Illinois. He was commenting about how it's so dangerous and all this other stuff. He said, it's not that bad. It's just the people are stupid. He said, if stupidity was food, everyone in Rockford, Illinois would weigh over 500 pounds and there'd be leftovers. The violent crime rate in Illinois is 425.9 for every 100,000 residents. The violent crime incidents, 53,612. That puts them at number five in the nation. Number 18, Delaware. Little surprised about this one because I know a lot about Wilmington. Wilmington is dangerous. The rest of Delaware isn't. Their violent crime rate is 431.9 for every 100,000 residents. The violent crime incidents, 4,262, putting them at number 45. Number 17, California. But Briggs, they've got San Francisco and Los Angeles. Why aren't they number one? Because they're not. The numbers don't add up. The violent crime rate in California is 442 for every 100,000 residents and violent crime incidents, 174,026. That puts them at number one in the nation. They also have the most people. Number 16, Texas. Yep, Texas is kind of violent. Most of that's gonna be coming from Houston, I imagine. Houston isn't the safest place these days. 
Uh, they've got some other places, probably a little more dangerous, but that that's their biggest city that's kind of not doing great, especially it's a little bit violent. The violent crime rate in Texas is 446.5 for every 100,000 residents. Their violent crime incidents, 131,084, putting them at number two in the nation. Number 15, Alabama. Alabama, yeah, surprise, surprise. I mean, they got Birmingham. Birmingham's a little bit of a nightmare. It's not as bad as you'd think, but the numbers don't really look good for Birmingham. Huntsville, though, it's a different country almost in Alabama. The violent crime rate in Alabama is 453.6 for every 100,000 residents. The violent crime incidents, 22,322, putting them at number 20 in the nation. 14, Oklahoma. You know, this is a place, Oklahoma City isn't that great either as Tulsa. They got some other smaller cities that, uh, they got some crime. And here they are at number 14. They don't have a lot of people too, so that helps them push this up on the list a little bit, I guess. The violent crime rate in Oklahoma is 458.6 for every 100,000 residents and their violent crime incidents, 18,255. Number 13, Nevada. You know, I'm sure if we would have done this list back in the 70s or 80s, it would have been a different story. Sometime around the late 80s, early 90s, uh, there really wasn't much organized crime there anymore. But actually, if you think about it, the organized crime, I think, kept street crime down in Las Vegas at the time. Strange, huh? Anyway, the violent crime rate in Nevada is 460.3 for every 100,000 residents, and their violent crime incidents, 14,445. Number 12, Montana. This one's a little surprising. I thought they'd be up there with Wyoming. I mean, they're big gun fans too. And usually when you have everyone wandering in the streets with guns, people don't assault each other. The violent crime rate in Montana is 469.8 for every 100,000 residents and their violent crime incidents, 5,077, putting them at 42 for that one. Number 11, Michigan. You know, the only reason they're here is because of Flint in Detroit, right? That's what got them here. Most of Michigan is really decent. The violent crime rate in Michigan is 478 for every 100,000 residents, and their violent crime incidents, 47,641. That's ranked seventh in the nation. Number 10, South Dakota. South Dakota, how'd they get dangerous? They're another one, like Wyoming and Montana. They usually go hand in hand, a lot like Vermont and New Hampshire. But here's South Dakota, way down here, North Dakota was a lot earlier. Anyway, the violent crime rate in South Dakota is 501.4 for every 100,000 residents residents. Their violent crime incidents, 4,476, ranking them number 43 in the nation on that. Number nine, South Carolina. Yeah, I'm a little surprised at this one. South Carolina is a decent state. A lot of their small towns, though, out in the middle of the state are kind of dangerous. It's a little bit more than most other states. I mean, small towns, sometimes you'll have like two or three in the whole state that have some problems and a lot of extra crime. It seems to be a trend here in South Carolina. The cities, you know, they're decent, but they have their crime too. Get some number nine on this list. The violent crime rate in South Carolina is 530.7 for every 100,000 residents and their violent crime incidents, 27,691. That's number 15 in the nation. Number eight, Missouri. Yeah, no kidding. Missouri has St. Louis on the east side of the state and the bad part of Kansas City on the west side of the state. On top of that, Springfield sucks. I do like Lake of the Ozarks, though. The violent crime rate in Missouri is 542.7 for every 100,000 residents. The violent crime incidence is 33,385. They're ranked 13th in the nation on that. Number seven, Louisiana. This one doesn't surprise me at all. New Orleans, Baton Rouge, Shreveport. There's always some weird crap going on in one of those three cities. So much so that their violent crime rate is 639.4 for every 100,000 residents. Violent crime incidents, 29,704. They're number 14 in the nation on that. Number six, Arizona. I am in shock on this one. I had no idea. But according to the FBI, they got some violence in Arizona. The violent crime rate is 654.8 for every 100,000 residents. And their violent crime incidents, 35,980. That puts them at number 12 in the nation. Number five, Arkansas. You know, if Arkansas could just give Little Rock and maybe Pine Bluff to some other state, there'd be a really nice place to live. Those are two of the most violent cities in the United States, and they're in Little Arkansas. The violent crime rate in Arkansas is 671.9 for every 100,000 residents. The violent crime incidents, 20,363, putting them at number 22 in the nation. Number four, Tennessee. You know, if you're in Tennessee, you probably just thought to yourself, thanks, Memphis, you got us on number four. Yeah, that's where, I don't know, 90% of the crime goes on, it seems like, is in Memphis. 
You know, Nashville and a couple other places have some crime, Chattanooga, but Memphis is the king of all crime in most of the South, actually. The violent crime rate in Tennessee is 672.7 for every 100,000 residents. Their violent crime incidents, 46,328, putting them number eight in the nation. Number three, New Mexico. Now, I've always known New Mexico's had some serious crimes. I did this video years ago after I read this article, and basically they'd start cutting back on so many services. Uh, jobs left, which meant more people were unemployed, more people started committing crime, and then since they didn't have the industries there and people weren't paying taxes, they had to cut back on the police, so it just kept snowballing. Now, uh, they've gotten a little bit better, but they're nowhere near where they need to be. The violent crime rate in New Mexico is... 778.3 for every 100,000 residents, and their violent crime incidents, 16,393, putting them at number 27. Number two, Alaska. Yes, Alaska has some pretty bad violent crime. That seems to be their thing. Their property crime isn't terrible. It just all seems to be violent crime. Anchorage is one of the most dangerous cities in the nation. Their violent crime rate is 837.8 eight for every 100,000 residents. The violent crime incidents, 6,126, putting them at number 40 in the nation. They don't have that many people. Huge state, they just don't have that many people. It's like the 48th most populous state. They only have 736,000 residents. Might be a little bit more. That was done in 2020. And if the trends have been going the way they had been going for Alaska, that number is probably lower. All right, before we get to number one, if you'd like to buy a t-shirt from World Courting Briggs, there's a link for them down below the video. Buy a t-shirt, support the channel. All right, on to number one. And number one, the District of Columbia. That's right, a city or a district is actually the most violent state in the nation. You know, I usually cut them out of all state lists. It's just they don't seem like a state to me, but I've noticed that almost every organization that does any kind of surveys or studies on states, they are included. A lot of them have started to include Puerto Rico too. But here they are on a list they probably don't want to be on and they're not coming off it anytime soon. They're so far ahead of everyone else. They're like a heavyweight boxer boxing lightweights. The violent crime rate in the District of Columbia is 999.8 for every 100,000 residents. Yeah, you heard me right. They're almost a thousand. So it's almost like one in 100 people are victims of a violent crime. The violent crime incidents in the District of Columbia is 7,127, ranking them 36th of the nation. And finally, Wyoming, one of my favorite states. Wyoming is wild. Wyoming is adventurous. It's beautiful. Doesn't have a ton of people. And this is why they don't. Have you ever noticed not a lot of people live in Wyoming? Some people really aren't sure the cowboy state actually exists. Before we go on, been there, it's a thing. Wyoming is the least populated state. They are number 50 when it comes to the national headcount, 51st if you count Washington, DC. This state has the fewest people, but comes in as the 10th largest state. You only get rankings like that if there's something wrong with the place. Here's the thing. There's no one major reason people have avoided Wyoming. By all accounts, it's an excellent place to live. They haven't had a giant nuclear meltdown. It isn't a toxic waste dump. They don't share a border with Mississippi, and they've never had a city like Detroit. There's no reason a bunch of people don't already live here. So what gives? Why is Wyoming the least populated state? In this video, we will look at 10 reasons why Wyoming has 1 16th the population of New York City. Got it? Get it? Good. Let's take a look. Number 10, rugged terrain. Wyoming has some of the most rugged terrain this country has to offer. The state is a great plateau broken by several mountain ranges. You have the Wind River Mountain Range. You have the Belfouge River Valley in the state's northeast corner. Absorca Range, Owl Creek, Wind River, and the Teton Range. There's a few other ones, but in the north central, there's the Bighorn Mountains. In the northeast, you got the Black Hills, Sierra Madre Range. Now, rugged terrain is something that can be overcome these days, but you got to think back to the early days when the population was growing, the mid-1800s or whatever, and these mountain ranges and this rugged terrain really stopped a lot of settlers from calling Wyoming home. Populations build over time, and with more hospitable terrain in other states in this area, it really stunted Wyoming's growth. Number 9. Harsh Weather Wyoming has some pretty harsh weather. 
Wyoming is known for having bitterly cold winters. With all the mountains and just about any place in that state, you're going to get a good amount of snow. Snow's just half the problem. The wind is legendary in Wyoming. With an average wind of 21.5 miles per hour, Wyoming is the second windiest state in the U.S. Wyoming has a semi-arid and continental climate that's drier and windier than the rest of the country. So this gives it more dramatic temperature swings. When you look at the 10 states with the lowest average temperature, Alaska is 28 degrees Fahrenheit, North Dakota is 41, Minnesota is 41.8, Maine is 41.9, Wyoming is 42.3 degrees. So they're the fifth coldest state in the U.S. Now once you get past all the cold, you got some decent summers, at least until wildfire season starts. Then you got some really bad air quality and you got to worry about your ranch burning to the ground. And that wind continues during wildfire season and that just helps it spread. And the weather has definitely kept a lot of people away from this state over the years. Or if they did move there, they last maybe a year and head on back to wherever they came from. Number eight, no big cities. Now, some people see this as a good thing. I'm one of them. I could really do without a major city. I grew up in the Los Angeles metro area, and I'm about done with large cities. When you don't have major cities, it kind of hurts your growth. It's just one less thing that people are looking for when they're looking for a new location. And yes, some people do need a big city for whatever their job they're doing. A lot of jobs are in major cities. Obviously, that's becoming less and less of a thing these days with the internet and people working from home, but there is still a ton of jobs that you're only going to find in major cities. And this, back in the day, stunted the the growth of Wyoming. Let me give you some comparison on population numbers from some other cities in the U.S. Los Angeles has 3.8 million residents. Now, their entire metro area has about 13 million. Portland, Oregon, where I currently live, they've got about 641,000. Denver, which isn't too far away from Wyoming, has 711,000. Denver's metro area has like 3 million residents. The closest major city to Wyoming is Salt Lake City, and the city itself has a population of over 200,000, with about 1.2 million living in the metro area. Cheyenne is Wyoming's largest city. They have 65,000 people. That's it. No metro area numbers. That's their entire city. They're followed by Casper with 58,000, Gillette with 32, Laramie with 31,000, and Rock Springs with 23,000. They don't have a lot of people living here. Number seven, limited available land. Yeah, even though it's a pretty big state, not all the land is available to people like homesteaders and developers. Large portions of Wyoming are owned by massive ranches, Native American reservations, U.S. government facilities, energy companies own a ton of Wyoming. Now, does this mean there's a housing shortage? No. What I'm saying is big companies that build whole communities and things like that, they don't have as many options as they might, let's say, in Montana, Utah, South Dakota, North Dakota, places like that. So this has kind of stunted their growth over the decades. Number six, lack of water. Yeah, they've got a real water problem. You'd think being this far north, they wouldn't, but Wyoming has a serious lack of surface water. Wyoming has suffered from droughts for as long as anyone can remember. The University of Wyoming Water Resource Data System indicates that the Cowboy State has been in a moderate to severe drought since 1999. If the state starts building giant communities or cities start expanding, this will just exasperate the situation. In case you don't know, there are three things human beings need. Water, food, and internet. Number five, lack of industries. Wyoming does have some industries, but they aren't industries that employ a whole bunch of people in most cases. Natural resources, tourism and outdoor recreation, and agriculture. Those are the three big industries in Wyoming. Now, they have all industries you could think of, but not on a large scale that would draw in more people to the state. They don't have a ton of manufacturing. Since they don't have giant cities and a whole bunch of people, they don't have many restaurants or retail locations. Public schools are usually a big employer to just about any city, but they don't have giant cities with giant school districts like you'd find in Los Angeles or Washington, something like that. Now, they do have great schools and great colleges. They just don't have a lot of them. There's no need. There's not a lot of people. Number four, 
It's really only for the outdoor types. Yeah, Wyoming is known to be an outdoor haven. If you like to hunt, fish, hike, camp, nature photography, that all happens in Wyoming. And a lot of people that are into that will move to Wyoming because they want to be near what they like to do. The thing is, not everyone's into that. And if you move to Wyoming and you're not the outdoor type, the state's best feature is completely lost on you. Some people prefer to do things indoors, in cities, and things like that. Actually, more people in the United States would prefer to live near some kind of metro area than not. And I'm not saying there's anything wrong with living near outdoor activities and forests and things like that. I love that. It's just most people in this country view camping the same way they view getting their wisdom teeth pulled. Number three, they don't promote it. Yeah, Wyoming doesn't really promote the state like a lot of other states do. Most states have a serious push to get people and industries into the state. Wyoming's kind of like, yeah, we're okay. Not saying they don't run those ads, you just never see them. They're not as active as a lot of the other states. Most people don't realize that if you're in California right now, you're going to hear ads on the radio, you're gonna see TV commercials, you'll even see billboards trying to attract you to move to Texas or Colorado, Arizona, places like that. Now, the locals can't stand the fact that all these Californians are moving to their state and they get mad at the Californians. Like, how about you get mad at your state and local officials who have these programs to lure Californians and California and industries to your state. Wyoming doesn't really do much of that. Number two, low diversity. Now, we always get a bunch of comments in the comment section of any video where this is brought up, that diversity is not a good thing. It's just all kinds of nonsense. Here's the thing. It matters to a lot of people. I know if you're living in a trailer in the Oklahoma outback and you don't want to hear about diversity and you think it's bad and all that, that's fine. You do your thing. Maybe keep it to yourself. But here's the thing. More people in the United States care about diversity than don't care about diversity. There's a lot of reasons this is a big thing for people. One, like I've always said, I think when you got a lot of diversity, you have a lot of good food, a lot of great festivals, things like that. Well, if you got low diversity, it sort of looks like an unfriendly place to a lot of diverse type people. Our last video was about the whitest states in the U.S. Wyoming is 92.5% white. They don't have a lot of different types of communities. And this, of course, has stunted the growth of Wyoming because a lot of people can't find their own types of people and their own types of communities in Wyoming. Now, I know someone's going to leave a comment about some city or town in Wyoming that has a strong this or that. Well, I'm sure they do. But overall and compared to other states, they really don't. All right, before we get to number one, don't forget we have another channel called On This Day. There's a link down below. All the proceeds for that channel go back to teachers. We donate through this thing called Donors Choose, and we give the money to teachers that have projects going in different schools, things like that. So if you want to go over there and subscribe, watch some videos, we'd really appreciate it. All right, on to number one. And number one, it's horrible for dating. Yes, this has stunted the growth of Wyoming in a big way. There's no one to date. When you don't have a bunch of people, you have less options. When you have less options, you end up dating the same people. And in Wyoming's case, there's a good chance you could be related to someone you swipe right on. It's just the odds of it happening eventually. Business Insider ranked them as the 45th worst place for dating opportunities. They ranked them for dating economics as the 15th worst place and their romance and fun, 41st place. Overall, they came in as the fourth worst state for dating out of all 50 states. I've mentioned that before in a past video we did about dating and you know chances of getting married in each state. And the biggest state that I got the comments from the most was Wyoming. And it was always females. They did not have anything nice to say about their dating prospects in Wyoming. It was actually kind of entertaining to read all the different comments. One girl said she'd been going on this dating spree after a breakup and she was on like Tinder, one of those things, and she went out on a date with a guy and she ended up going back to his apartment and everything was fine. Nothing really happened, she said, but like two weeks later, she went on another date. It was his roommate. She went back to the same apartment. A few months later, she had another date. It was the guy that lived below those two guys in the same apartment building. Now, if you just heard me say that and you're from Alaska, you're probably going, yeah, and why is that unusual? They have the same problem. So how does that affect the population? Well, a lot of people will move out if they don't really have a lot of dating prospects or the chance to meet a decent person to marry. 
that does bother a lot of people. A lot of single people and divorcees over the years have left Wyoming because of limited options. And that has severely stunted the state's growth. All right, that is our super cut. I hope you guys enjoyed it. I hope you got some information out of it. Let us know in the comment section below if you think we should take one of our other series and turn them into one of these videos. Everybody have a great day. Be nice to each other.